Hello and welcome back to the channel. So we're asking today, should the police be able to arrest you and throw you in jail for rescuing sick animals and saving their lives? Well, that's exactly what happened to animal rights activist Wayne Chung. Wayne is now facing another potential prison sentence, this time for rescuing dogs from an animal testing facility. Wayne is actually here with me now joins us now to discuss the situation and answer some of these questions. Thank you for agreeing to come on the channel and get into this with us, Wayne. It's my pleasure. Looking forward to chatting. Great. So let's kick off then. Um, putting you in jail for helping sick animals, re rescuing sick animals from certain death, it sounds absolutely ridiculous. So I guess if you want to talk us through exactly what happened to fill people in on you know, how did this, how has it gone there? How has it gone this way? Yeah, it's, it's, unfortunately, it's even worse than just putting me in jail for rescuing sick animals. It's putting me in jail after we had reported to the authorities that animals were sick because of animal abuse. There was a massive egg production facility in Sonoma County, California called Sunrise Farms that was lying to the public about its compliance with a very important law that passed in California in 2008 that prohibited the use of battery cages. I know you know what a battery cage is, but for your listeners, a battery cage is this almost medieval torture device. It's that can house maybe eight hens or so. They each receive less than a square foot of space each. This is a three pound animal, like raising a chihuahua on a piece of paper their entire lives. And as a result of the confinement, you know, the animals are trampling on each other. They, uh, sicken each other. If there's a disease, it spreads to the facility like wildfire and they're banned. They should have been unlawful. Um, it was passed in 2008, window effect in January, 2015. And this company, despite selling its products at really high end grocers that were marketing their products as humane mm. was out just outright breaking the law. And so we went into the facility for the first time in 2016, a year after the law went into effect, partly because the government's own inspectors, we're issuing reports that we had obtained saying, hey, all these egg farms are violent in the law. They're just breaking the law left and right. We have to do something about this. So we went and just confirmed that this specific facility in Sonoma County was in fact confining tens and tens of thousands of animals in battery cages and reported to the authorities multiple times from 2016 to 2018. And they never even responded. They did not give us a single reply. And so in May 2018, about 500 of us organized by myself and a, a number of other activists at Direct Action Everywhere, uh, peacefully in broad daylight and after calling the authorities, walked to the facility ourselves, both to show the public what was happening inside and to give care of the animals who were suffering from abuse, who in some cases were so sick they could not even stand, uh, who the government had neglected. And I ended up in jail as a result. So you're basically doing the job that the government should have been doing, uh, enforcing the laws they brought in to, well, in their eyes, protect animals from the abuses and things that you were seeing. And you enforce it and you get put in jail for enforcing the laws they put into place. That's pretty ridiculous. much. And That's absolutely, it, you know, it was so that and the other unique thing about this law, um, this law has faced enormous amount of litigation in the industry. And unfortunately, even the US government <laughs> have been trying to bring it down. And one of the unique right. things about this particular law is it wasn't passed by powerful people. It was passed by the citizens. In fact, mm -hmm. there were more California citizens who voted for this law to protect animal welfare than any ballot initiative in California history at that point. Right. It was, you know, over 8 million Californians. And the government's response when democracy and the people asked them, hey, we got to start protecting these animals from torture, was to put the people who blew the whistle on the fact that they were not doing their job in jail. So, so they jailed, yeah. you, jailed you for, for, for calling that out, that they weren't doing their job on something that people voted in, which alone, putting someone in jail for that alone is just ridiculous. And then secondly, not only did you go in there and just basically prove that they're not doing their jobs, you also helped the animals that that were going to absolutely suffer and die. Um, and for those two reasons, they put you in jail. Which, you know, if it were only one or the other, it would be ridiculous as it stands, right? But considering yeah. you did two things that which 99% of people would consider to be good, right? but they, they jailed you for that. And then also I know, I see they tried to kind of bend the narrative on it as well. Didn't they? They tried to paint you out as some kind of, 
criminal, some kind of uh, danger to society and the way they treated you, right? Um, am I right there with, with the, that they did that? Yeah, unfortunately, it's it's even worse than that, David. They actually have accused me of bioterrorism. So <laughs> during my sentencing hearing, the owner of the farm got up there and basically said, this guy who organized hundreds of people peacefully, I mean, the, the activists walk into the farm. I mean, these are people who are sometimes in their 70s holding flowers, who are, you know, holding peace signs up to every employee and and we're trained in nonviolence. We told everyone we we're here with love in our hearts for everybody. I mean, even the workers here, they're caught in the system too. A lot of workers are mistreated, as you know, in slaughterhouses and factory farms. Mm -hmm. So we're here just to help these animals and show the public that laws are being broken. And, and somehow a grandmother holding a flower became an act of terrorism in the government's eyes. And uh, that might seem odd until you realize the enormous amount of money <laughs> and power this industry has to bend the law in its favor. And, and sadly, it's the same across the world, really. Animal agriculture and agriculture in general, because of their traditional importance to the economy of not just the United States, but every country in the world, mm -hmm. they have enormous political influence and they can get away with not only breaking the law, but going after their critics in a pretty merciless way. And that's kind of what's happened to us for the last seven years. It's, yeah, they've been achieving that also with these uh, ag gag laws, which prevent people from um, filming inside farms. And uh, well, you can film, obviously, it's, as long as you don't get caught. But releasing the footage, they, they, that's where the gag gag law comes in. That if you go into a farm and film and get evidence of them breaking the law, abusing animals, if you try to publish that footage and they find who you are, then you you could potentially be faced with massive fines, or even potentially it, it comes under. Some, some don't some states put it under under a terrorism act of some sort as well like is it quite severe in some places there's a federal law in the united states called the animal enterprise terrorism act that in some cases has been used against activists for just engaging in free speech activity and in the united states free speech is supposedly this ironclad right it's literally the first in our bill of rights our constitution protects your right to say whatever the hell you want you know mm -hmm. you can yell at the president you can yell at the FBI, you can yell at the CIA in theory, and they're not allowed to come after you because that's mm -hmm. something that the founding fathers of this country said, hey, you can't really have a free society if you're not even allowed to say what you think, right? Which makes sense. It's a good idea. Yeah. But when it comes to animal ag, somehow not only have they passed laws repeatedly across the country that criminalize the act of speech. In the case of the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, they went after these activists in Santa Cruz, not far from where I'm sitting here, just for chalking. They literally were just chalking, writing things on a sidewalk, which the chalking itself wasn't illegal. And they accused them of terrorism, right? I um, mean, it took right. a federal judge to throw out the case and say, like, actually, you know, this law, you're not allowed to go after people for chalking. You're not allowed to go after people for leafleting. You're not allowed to go after people for taking photographs inside of a factory farm. But despite the fact that federal judges have repeatedly struck these laws down across the country, they just keep passing and passing over and over again. And the key mm -hmm. thing they're trying to achieve is not even really successfully convicting someone. And this is the key bit, even about my case, because mm. a lot of people look at my case and they get scared. And that is not the right reaction for the movement because they're trying to turn me into almost a, an inverse figurehead, a figurehead for what happens to you when you right. cross the industry. And the reality is the vast majority of time when you speak out against the industry, even when you rescue animals from these abusive places, I went in jail because I deliberately ran into the buzzsaw. <laughs> Like I invited this case, I begged and pleaded for them to try and prosecute me. Right. And, and, and even the incarceration process itself, it was not fun. It's a terrible experience to be in jail, but I thought it would be an important way for us to elevate this case for the vast majority of people who care about animals. Their main goal with these laws is not actually to incarcerate you. It's to scare you. Mm -hmm. And the best thing for us to do, just don't be scared. I imagine that they're also, when they try to throw the book at people doing chalking, the idea is that they know the media is going to pick up on that and there'll be headlines the next day that, that, that you know, chalking is now some act of terrorism or, or these animal rights extremists have been hit with the law. And, and so it's, they, they know how the media works. They know whoever did that, whoever tried to throw the book at those activists for chalking, they knew it wasn't going to stick. That wasn't the yeah. point. It was a statement. It was a, we're going to keep doing this. We'll throw the book at you, like throwing the book at you. We're going to put you in jail. I mean, how many days were you in jail? So I had a 90 day sentence and right. I served 38 days this time. 
because I had previously been in jail so many times and because of certain California statutes that give you the benefit of good time. So I was in jail from November 2nd, I think, to December 9th right. last year. So the point being, they know for a fact that putting you in jail for even if you did the full 90 days, they know that's not going to be enough to dissuade you from going out and doing it again. They know for a fact that it would take a, sig a lot more to put you, because the, the idea of jail, right, is that the person is supposed to be punished so they won't do the thing again. 90 days is not putting you off doing it again. They know that, that that was not the point of you going to jail. The point of you going to jail was to say, hey, you do stuff like this and we're going to put you in jail, right? And people are, are terrified of that. I mean, I know you yeah. you probably mentally prepped to go to jail for the last, like, I don't know how many years. You've been doing so many <laughs> direct action events. You probably always kind of had the idea, but the average person, the average vegan, the average activist probably is terrified of it. And they know that. Do you yeah. think that's what they're doing? Do you think it's a statement? I think that absolutely is what their goal is. And I think they're failing. And the reason they're failing is because the animal rights movement has learned. Uh, you're in the UK, right, David? I'm in Finland, but I'm from the UK, yeah. You're from the UK. Okay, so you're, you're probably familiar with the Shack case, which yep. unfolded both in the United Kingdom, where I think it was called Operation Bike Back or something like that in the United yeah. Kingdom, where yeah, they yeah, went yeah. hard after animal rights actors targeting this vivisection facility, jailed a bunch of them, you know, used lawsuits, prosecution, infiltration to destroy the grassroots animal rights movement back in the early to mid 2000s against this horrible facility called Hunting and Life Sciences that was caught on video camera in the UK, in the UK and in the United States doing things like punching beagle puppies, beagle puppies in the face as they're screaming in agony because they won't take the force feed tube. So they're trying to force feed these dogs poison. Naturally, the dog's like, oh, this is hurting me. Can you not do that? And so they're, they're resisting and crying and they're punching them in the face repeatedly to induce compliance and vivisecting monkeys a lot. Like without anesthesia, there's mm -hmm. experimental footage that PETA got undercover showing them like just tearing a, a monkey open. And so naturally, I mean, these are crimes. <laughs> animal rights activists are really upset about this. And there was a direct action campaign in the United Kingdom that spread to the United States, where in the United States, six activists serve very serious prison time, um, right. anywhere from one to, I think, seven years is the longest sentence, mostly for running a website, not even for doing the direct action themselves, just for promoting right. it. And the animal rights movement was really hurt by that. People were scared because they saw those sentences and thought, I can't do that. I mean, I, I don't want to end up in prison myself. And that was actually the genesis of the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act that I previously mentioned to you. Right. So the difference this time around is, is one, um, we had a legal strategy from day one on how to handle these charges in, in a way that would amplify the movement rather than suppress it. And in particular, one of the key things we've done is have a legal strategy where people can see the purpose of the cases. It's not just animal rights activists potentially going to prison for their activism. It's animal rights activists defending a principle that animals are legal persons and not things, that if we win or even get close to winning, that will have transformative impacts across the entire United States if we win. So even if I'm incarcerated, just as we know from prior social justice movements, the civil rights movement in Rosa Parks, Susan B. Anthony, who went to trial for trying to vote in the 19th century, Nelson Mandela in South Africa, there have been so many instances where going to jail and being willing to risk your own freedom has been part of the movement. But you have to you have to plan for that from day one. It can't be right. something like suddenly the FBI shows up and like, oh my God, what do we do? <laughs> yeah, you have to yeah. start thinking about, okay, the FBI is going to show up at your doorstep one day. How can we harness that repression to create change for animals? And I think that's exactly what we've done. And just one quick bullet point to justify that argument, because you know it's easy to say like, oh yeah, you're just kind of some bozo who keeps doing things, keeps getting arrested, and you want to try and make your life look like it had some purpose. I am not a particularly significant person. Uh, I don't feel like <laughs> I have any extraordinary capabilities. And I've had now multiple op-eds in the biggest newspapers in the world, including the New York Times, right? And that's directly as a result of these cases. It's not because of anything right. exceptional I've done other than getting prosecuted, right? That, sure. that was my route in the New York Times. And millions of people read that op-ed. It's about how I stole piglets, quote unquote, stole piglets from a big factory farm in Utah, and the jury quitted me. Right. But the other thing that's really important is not just for us to have a legal strategy, but for us to have a movement strategy to support the defendants, continue telling their story. Because I was actually just talking to my good friend, Lauren, who is in prison for five years as part of the Shaq campaign this morning. Literally, I talked to her this morning. Right. And one of the hardest things for her, and honestly, one of the most, the saddest things for me as an animal rights activist, and 
I, I get it. I hate to say this, but I'll call out our own movement a little bit. One of the most shameful things is that we just didn't support the defendants enough. Right. You know, these people felt abandoned and alone in prison and they got some mail in jail, for, for example. But when they came out, it just felt like, what was the point of that? And right. if you're going to ask people to take these risks and we want people to be brave, we want people to take these risks. Our movement has to continue harnessing their stories, which is one of the reasons I'm super grateful to you <laughs> for talking to me, because as I face this next trial, if I'm in jail for 16 years, if I know David Rams and his audience is following the story and continuing to use my incarceration to advocate for the animals that never get a day outside of a jail, that never get a day outside of a cage, then I'm going to feel a lot better sitting there in that cage than if I'm sitting in that cage thinking, what's the point of any of this? You know, you know, and I would hope that it, not only the people who watch this video who are already vegan, but I know there are people who watch my channel and watch these videos who are not vegan. And uh, maybe they're, they're afraid to speak up and say that they're not vegan and, and things like that. And they're not too sure and they're learning or whatever. But I think what you do especially should appeal to both vegans and non-vegans alike, because what you're not doing is your, your form of activism and the work you do, it's, it's not even necessarily focusing on telling someone you should be vegan although you should by the way that's not this is not like a get out but you are taking sick animals out of these places where they've been not they're going to be killed eventually but you're take you're going in and, and spotting the ones who have actually not only are they being sent to be killed in some weeks or whatever they're being abused like actually physically abused neglected they're going to most likely die in pain um, of some kind of horrible sickness they've contracted or, or their legs have broken and they're just sitting there dying over a space of how many days that, or hours or even could be even weeks. You know, you're going in and helping those animals. So I feel that it, it's not even specifically that vegans that you should be getting support from. You should be getting support from anyone out there who opposes this type of just in your face animal cruelty. Um, so, I mean, I, I would hope that, you know, that appeals to people who watch the channel as well, not only the vegans who watch the channel. Um, and I'd like to ask a question, actually, because the, there will be people who watch the channel who are just waiting to get into the comments to get into you, wrote, to rip into you. And one of the things I know they're going to say is something along the lines of, well, you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes, or something along the lines of, you do the crime, <laughs> you do the time. You committed the crime, you did the time, you can't complain. This is the kind of thing, this is the most common thing I see whenever a vegan gets jail time or gets caught and, and is now arguing that, well, it shouldn't be illegal. This is what people say. Have you had that before? And, and what do you normally say to that when that comes up? I hear that all the time. And, and my, you know, the response I give over and over again is it's not a crime. Um, We've seen massive evolution in the law over the last 150 years with respect to women, with respect to people of color, with respect to LGBT folks. So a week and a half ago, we had um, on in, at one of our Open Rescue Advocates meeting with Simple Heart, the organization I co-founded a couple of years ago with Priya Sahani and a couple other individuals, a guy by the name of Evan Wilson, who's a leading gay rights lawyer in the United States. And Evan Wilson told us about how in 1983, when he wrote his thesis at Harvard Law School, he argued that gay rights and, and just the gay identity is a constitutional right. But back then it was a crime. At least that's what most people thought. They thought mm -hmm. you can't marry someone when you're gay. You can't, you can't sodomize someone. And in fact, in majority of states in the United States, just being gay, there were laws called anti-sodomy laws that made being gay a crime. When people right. tried to marry each other, they were denied a marriage license and told, that's illegal. You can't do that. And right. Evan Wilson made the point, no, even in 1983, before all these Supreme Court cases, before all this activism made the gay rights movement, in my view, the most successful social movement in American history, it was already our right. And we make the same argument for animal rights that all of us who've been through second grade biology, all of us who've interacted for five seconds with a dog, understand that these creatures are not things. A dog is not a piece of property. A pig is not a dented can. That is literally an argument the prosecution made in the Utah Smithfield trial, where we rescued two sick piglets. And the, the prosecutor basically said, well, you, you can't take a sick piglet any more than you can take a dented can. And the jury, which was comprised 100% of non-vegans, conservative Mormon folks in an agricultural region of the country, 
even they rejected their argument. They said, no, there's, there's a difference between a dented can and a piglet. But here's the key bit. If there is a difference, and if we recognize morally and legally that a piglet, a puppy, is not a dented can, is not just a laboratory test tube, then suddenly an entire panoply of rights accrues not only to the animals, but to third parties who are trying to help them. Right. I think everybody in the world, if you see a dog trapped in a hot car, wasting away, dying of heat exhaustion, clamoring at the window, desperate to escape as the temperature is rising 130, 140 degrees, this dog's being cooked alive. I would hope that most of us would say like, look, it's not my dog, I'm gonna break that window. I'm gonna break that window, I'm gonna save that dog's life. And, and in fact, this is a right in the United States, in most states, you can just break the window to help the dog. And there's absolutely no difference between a dog trapped in a hot car and a, tra and a dog trapped in a laboratory cage, a piglet trapped in a gestation or farrowing crate. And, and so we're just taking that legal principle to its logical conclusion. And the proof is in the pudding. We've won a lot of these cases. Now we've lost some too, which is why I've been incarcerated. But the key thing is even when we've lost, we haven't lost because it's been a fair fight and the public decided, yeah, you know what? I kind of like the idea of a piglet slowly starving to death in a factory farm cage. I like the idea of a puppy being force fed laundry detergent until she vomits blood and dies. Instead, what's happened is the industry has manipulated the political and legal system to prevent us from making that argument. Right. In the most recent trial, I was not allowed a single minute of my investigative footage that showed over and over again that this company was breaking the law and torturing animals. And when you're left with that sort of fight in court, the jury just hears a bunch of you broke into a farm and took a bunch of chickens, a bunch of you broke into uh, a, a pen outside of a, a goat slaughterhouse and took a baby goat. That's kind of like stealing somebody's pet. Mm. But I'm convinced that when we actually have a fair fight, legally and morally, the vast, vast majority of Americans do not want to see animals suffer. They just don't. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. You, you know, when you were talking about the dented can and someone on the other side made that comparison to, well, you, you can't take a piglet the same way you can't take a dented can, a sick piglet, a dented can made that comparison. Obviously that loses a lot of people. And then with this new trial that you were just uh, jailed over, they made sure that there was no conversation that could get anywhere close to that same conversation again, because they know the second farmers start talking or, or not even just farmers, whoever it was, the defendants, the people representing them, the second they start referring to living beings as no more than like, oh, it's just like a dented can or a, a broken thing in a shop. They know that they're going to lose that case and they know the only way that it's going to get to that conversation is by you being allowed to talk about how these animals aren't things, right? So that's why they blocked it because they know the defense is going to start saying stuff like that because that's they have to. They literally have to. When you start talking about them as individual beings with individual personalities who have a subjective experience um, and feel pain and suffer and have happiness and joy, much like your dog at home, the only response to that is no, they're just property. They're just like a, a broken thing on the shelf. And that's when they're going to lose every time, right? Because nine out of 10 people will look at that and say, that's disgusting that you just said mm -hmm. that, right? That's, so you're always going to win. They have to shut that down. And that's what they yeah. succeeded in doing in the last trial, right? They shut that down completely. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think most people, including non-vegans, recognize how completely stupid that is and how absurd that is. But the problem is, and, and you've pointed out this more than anybody and as effective as anybody, a lot of non-vegans do this in their own heads too, when they justify eating animals, when they go to the grocery right. store and they buy that bacon and they don't see that bacon as anything other than, oh, it's just a product. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's evidence behind this. There's research showing that when people eat animals, they start believing that animals are less sentient and conscious than they previously did, just by virtue of the fact that they they took that product and put that product into their mouth. It's cognitive dissonance avoidance. And so we can mock the prosecution for making these completely stupid and biologically absurd arguments, but we have to recognize that a lot of us are doing this ourselves. I did this. I did this for years as an animal lover. Like I loved eating bologna. I loved, I mean, pigs are the most intelligent farm animal species we exploit. And they're significantly more intelligent than dogs, for example. They uh, are far more intelligent than a three-year-old child. Uh, they're incredibly curious, beautiful, gentle creatures. And pork is the number one food, the number one meat that Chinese people eat. And I loved eating pork for years as someone who loved pigs and animals. But every time 
I got up in the morning and I ate, you know, the ground pork, the, the all these pork dishes uh, for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner that we eat in Chinese cuisine. I wouldn't even think about the fact that actually there's this creature who is a sentient being who suffered enormously for this. Because if I thought about that, I wouldn't want to eat the pork. And so I think it, all of us have to challenge ourselves to not be that stupid prosecutor who's not realizing this bacon on my plate is not just bacon. This was once a living being who suffered unfathomably, unfathomably. And, and yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of ways to approach that problem of cognitive dissonance avoidance. I mean, the way you approach of humor and just like <laughs> gentle mockery is beautiful and elegant and powerful. Um, and the way we approach it is trying to bring the absurdity of these arguments out in the court of law to force the system to justify itself legally so the entire country and the entire world can see how stupid and convoluted these arguments actually are. You know, I've, I've, um, we went through the, one of the things that people tend to say in response to what you do, and that was the kind of stupid game, stupid prizes. I wanted to follow up with that. There's another one that uh, and I know people will be saying in response to this kind of segment we've just been through. When you talked about breaking the car window to save the dog, um, and when we, we likened these animals to the animals that we, uh, that we spend our time with. We spoke about, uh, uh, we spoke about dogs in, in a laboratory, we spoke about pigs in the farms and chickens in the farms, and then the dog we have at home and the pet. The, the, one of the arguments people will say is, you've already stated yourself that these are not property, these are not things. Um, but then some people would res res respond to that saying, well, they are, but that, that was what they were bred for. That the, the dog at your home, they're stiff, this is different, it's a companion animal. The, anim the dog in the uh, lab, they were bred for that purpose. The chicken in the farm was bred for that purpose. The pig in that farm was bred for that purpose. They are someone's property and it's not the same as the animal that you have at home and you don't have a right to break in and take someone's property, th this animal that was bred for that purpose. Uh, they would say the, the fact they were bred for that makes them property. This is, I've seen this logic quite a lot. What do you think about that? I think we dispelled that argument hundreds of years ago when we discarded feudalism. I mean, there was a time around the world where a powerful person could decide who you were and say, you are a serf, you are a peasant. I don't care if you're the smartest person in the world and you could make scientific discoveries more important than Einstein or Newton. You're going to till my fields because I'm going to tell you who you are. And that's not right. We realized hundreds of years ago that freedom is the right of all sentient beings. You choose who you are. No one gets to decide what you care about, who you love, what you desire, whether you should live in a cage or be free. If you voluntarily want to live in a cage for your entire life, by all means, I, I'm totally supportive of someone living in a cage. But a powerful person, or in this case, it's not even a person, it's a powerful corporation that is profiting to the tune of billions of dollars off of human beings and animals, decides, you know what, I've decided you're the sort of creature who's gonna live in a cage as small as your entire body for your entire life. That's not right. That's not the way the world works. And human evolution and moral evolution of the last few hundred years has proven that societies that treat living beings with some degree of respect, some degree of autonomy, thrive. While societies that repress and confine and constrain people, whether it's gay marriage, women's rights, the rights of people of color, those societies fall apart. So. This is a moral imperative, but it's also a strategic imperative for the survival of human society. If we do not treat the most vulnerable among us with some degree of respect, all of us will look at a system like that and realize, you know what, today it's that pig in a cage. But tomorrow, if this powerful company is allowed to do whatever they want to choose who you are and put you in a place where your life every single day is living in anguish underneath a powerful person or corporation, they could come after me next. And that actually literally happens. The exact same pig farm where we found those two sick piglets collapsed on the floor, unable to walk, starving to death, had literally been implicated in human trafficking and slavery. And for those of us who have seen how these companies operate, that is no surprise. That is absolutely no surprise. Because if you're routinely accustomed to ignoring the cries of sentient beings who are suffering, if you're routinely telling sentient animals, I don't care what you need or want, I don't care what you design your life, you're going to be a thing for me to abuse. Well, the next step is to do that to another vulnerable party, like a human being, and that's exactly what they've done. So I don't think anyone believes that just because you're born into a certain caste, you're born into a certain class, you have to be there. 
And the same is true of farm animals or animals in labs. That beagle did not choose to be a test tube. She wanted a family. She wanted friends. I mean, it's time for us to give them their choice. It's an easy argument to make for the one holding the knife or holding the syringe, isn't it? That they're, that's what they're here for, or, or holding the fork in many cases. And it's the yeah. it's the same type of, but people don't like it when I say this, but I'll say it again. Um, it's the same logic that's been used by, so just pick, 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 take a pick of any of the worst people in human history and look what logic they used to do what they do. And it is identical to what people say now about, they're, they're bred for it, that's their purpose. Uh, as an excuse to do horrible things to them, you know, you can you can take a look at how how men have treated women. Well, you know, this because because they're women, that's what they're here for, right? They're not here to do the things I can do. Uh, look at how uh, white people have treated pretty much everybody else. Uh, well, they're not they're not like me, and I've got the most power, therefore I can do what I want to them. And you know, they're they're not as smart as me, or you know, now in some cases, as you know, in some parts of the world, now they are bred for that. They were literally, it's weird to use the word to describe humans, but they were breeding humans into slavery. So this is, that was their purpose. Did it make it okay? Well, of course not. It doesn't matter what they're bred for, does it? And then if you're going to use that argument, like, well, you, you've got very bad company using that logic, haven't you? You're in bad company mm -hmm. if you're going to talk like that, right? Um, so I know, I, of course, I agree. Do you know the the story of Mary Wollstonecraft and Thomas Taylor in the 18th century? Have you heard this story? No, 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 I don't know this. It's wild. It's a wild story. So I'll be brief on this. But so Mary Wollstonecraft was one of the early women's rights actors who said, women are not things. You cannot abuse us. You cannot deny us the right to vote. You know, she wrote this book called The Vindication of, of the Rights of Women. Um, or I think that's a title, something like that. And it was roughly 1780. And a distinguished Cambridge philosopher by the name of Thomas Taylor said, wait, you're telling me this is your place in society and you're telling me you don't like it. That's not the way the world works. When you have your place in society, you stick to it. You can't change that. And you're a woman. And this is what women do. You're basically a thing for the pleasure of men. You know, th they didn't have the right to testify. They didn't have the right to hold property. They didn't have the right to vote. They had no rights at all. And that was just their place in society. And how dare you challenge that? And the interesting thing is Thomas Taylor's approach to showing that women's rights cannot be true is, was to write a book called a Vind and this is a parody. He was trying to basically mock women's rights activists right, when okay. Mary Wollstonecraft wrote this book. And he wrote a parody called A Vindication of the Rights of Brutes, saying all the arguments you're making that, you know, sentient beings should get the right to choose who they want to be. I shouldn't just be beholden to the interest of someone else, subject to torture and abuse just because I'm less powerful than a man. And, you know, it is true that on average, women are physically less physically large and less physically strong as men. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Thomas Taylor said, well, if that's a reason not to abuse women, that's also a reason not to abuse animals. And his conclusion oh, was, therefore, women's rights and animal rights both are illogical and absurd because <laughs> if might does not make right and it does not make right with respect to the abuse of women, then it doesn't make, it's not right with respect to the use of animals too. And, and so I think you know, the decision point we've reached in society today after 200 years of activism of various sorts that have just changed the game in terms of women's rights, in terms of civil rights and the rights of people of color, disability, gay rights, is do we want to be on Mary Wollstonecraft's side or Thomas Taylor's side? And if we're on Mary Wollstonecraft's side and we believe that women are not things, women should have the right to vote, should have the right to hold property, should have the right to not be abused by their husbands just because they got into a marriage, then we should be on the right on the side of animals too, because mm -hmm. the logical principle, the moral principle, is exactly the same. I laughed not at what he said. I laughed because of him accidentally making the argument for animal rights. That's what I found yeah. funny. It's that 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 is actually very. It's funny that he stumbled upon that whilst trying to roast women. It's like no, no, you got a good point. That actually, we shouldn't do it to animals <laughs> either. Thank you. I know it's but, hilarious. You've kind of just basically kicked off the animal rights movement there by accident. <laughs> yeah. No, it's kind of hilarious. Um, yeah. yeah, I went back and looked at the paper recently and it's, you're right. It is kind of an elegant argument. It's, it's, it's an elegant <laughs> accidental argument for animal rights back in the 18th century. Wow. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, one of your, uh, one of the, I saw a comment recently and uh, I want to stick on this kind of like 
critiques of you to to keep people mm -hmm. engaged. I know you like this, guys, and especially the non vegans are enjoying this. I'm sure. Um, trying to play the devil's advocate for you, you know. Um, so I saw this this uh, U.S. senator on a on a post about one of the ducks you rescued, uh, River. The duck's name is River. And he, did you see this comment? He left a comment and he said, um, mm -hmm. River would probably taste great, he said. Um, mm. And this is, again, US senator, not no small no small um, guy. Like he had a lot of followers. I, oh, yeah, there you go. You've got the Madison Cawthorn. Madison Cawthorn, yeah. Former US congressman. And he had about, I believe, like 500,000 followers or something like that. Blue tick, you know, like yeah. a big deal to be putting something like that out there um yeah so so i mean your thoughts on that and and also a question do you think this is a good example of the level of disregard for animals in the american legal system is, is he basically like the poster boy for that with that comment do you think yeah madison cawthorn is uh is honestly a wonderful symbol for the opposition to animal rights because he is an idiot <laughs> <laughs> he I, and I say that with all respect to Madison. I don't I, I don't mean that as an insult. I just mean that descriptively. The guy okay. just doesn't make any sense. Right. Um, this this is a guy who has gone after gay rights activists and gay marriage repeatedly while apparently having a lot of trysts of his staff members, male staff members on the side. This is a guy who repeatedly has defended Donald Trump in the face of clear evidence of not just fraudulent misrepresentations of what happened in 2020, but you know, outright corruption, just things like affairs. I mean, just blatant misconduct. And, and Cawthorn was kicked out of office. He's a former US Congress person now, but he's kicked out of office because the American public even, even the right wing. I mean, this guy lives in one of the most conservative, MAGA, Trump country parts of the world, and he was voted out of office. And he is the sort of person who is opposing the animal rights movement publicly because there are very few good arguments against animal rights. The best you can do is act like a seventh grader who's upset that someone's pointed out something wrong that you've done, right? And, yeah. and that's what seventh graders do. Seventh grade boys, and I mean, he's, I don't know how old he is. I think he's in his twenties, maybe his thirties, mm. but he still acts like a seventh grade boy. Can when I just someone says, yeah. when someone yeah. says to you, hey, like you did something and, and here's like the harm it caused, here's why, you know, it wasn't the best for me. It wasn't the best for you. It wasn't the best for anyone. And you just kind of go, no, 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 I'm going to do it some more because I like it. You know, that's that's a seventh grade response. And yeah. and I think and I, I know you've seen this, too, because you do such a good job of just logically disemboweling the arguments against animal rights and pointing out how vacant they are. But Madison shows how when we're trying to have a real honest conversation about animal rights, and I think there are some arguments that are worth addressing. Um, but the idea that I'm just going to mock the position by saying, I'm going to do it anyways. I don't care what you think. I'm going to do it anyways. I mean, surely we've evolved beyond the seventh grade. And we all remember in the seventh grade people doing that sort of thing to teachers, yeah, yeah. to authority figures, and to each other. And and so to me, you know, if you're inspired by Madison Cawthorn, which I don't think a lot of people are, even in his <laughs> neck of the woods, then you got some deep personal reflection to do because you're being inspired by the wrong type of ideas. Yeah, I guess you can do you can you can do a lot better, right? As, you know that's the kind of the point there, isn't it? And, and the video we commented on was a video that was showing the journey of River the Duck from being mm -hmm. just disease ridden, injured, sitting in all her own feces, to now being recovered and happy. And this is the video he left a comment that she'd probably taste great on, which is you know it's just like you said, it's seventh grade. It's it's just meant to invoke a a, a response, um, a, a negative reaction. It's a troll comment from someone who's, uh, so, you know, you'd expect to be a little more mature than that, um, being a Congress, ex-congressman. Um, just just cir circling back to it, you said something at the beginning about him being against gay marriage, but I missed the bit you said after it. What, what's he been doing with his male staff members? So, yeah, Madison Cawthorn, had, I don't know if you've heard about this, but he was outed <laughs> repeatedly. There are a bunch of videos and photos of him basically asking for and apparently sometimes engaging in various forms of sexual intercourse with his male staff members. Right. And so that's why. That, so was, right, there was this okay. huge sex scandal. And again, I mean, people's personal lives are personal lives. I normally sure. would not give a shit. But the problem is when there's enormous hypocrisy, when you're yeah. attacking and antagonizing the LGBT community while you're secretly doing exactly the same things yourself. I mean, that's not right. So, but you see this yeah. time and time again, you know, like I, and like, to his credit, and and 
I, I think it's always good to try and steal a man on the other side instead of just because that's what the mm. people like Madison Cawthorn are doing. They're just mocking the other side. Mm. I think one of the reasons people like Madison Cawthorn respond the way they do, whether it's the gay rights or animal rights, is because they genuinely feel guilty. And I mean, honestly, I did this myself. I was talking about how I, you know, used to eat tons of bacon and try to justify it. And it is like a natural human response that when you feel guilty about something, when someone criticizes you and realize, oh, they have a point. You know, when, when criticism is stupid, it doesn't actually hurt. We don't have to respond to it. So if someone yeah. came to the two of us and said, hey, I think you're torturing the secret elves of Narnia under the mountain, we'd be like, what are you talking about? I mean, thanks, I guess. And we just move on with our lives. It wouldn't land. But if someone points out, hey, like, you know, Honestly, you, you're a little rude sometimes in meetings and you realize, oh, Jesus, that's <laughs> kind of true. I think I am being a little rude. That's when you get defensive and angry and you have to like justify and explain. And, but again, when we're not seventh graders, hopefully we've evolved to the point that we can take that criticism, realize it hurts and transform that defensive reaction into growth, right? That's what you should do when someone tells you, hey, you talk too much in meetings and it's rude. No one else gets to talk. Instead of just getting defensive and angry and attacking the other person, you think about it and say, like, huh, I wonder if that's true. And when you realize it's true, instead of getting angry, you evolve, you change. Mm -hmm. And and so I think Madison and people like him are just at that earlier stage of the growth process that all of us have been through. I mean, I actually don't know your vegan story. I bet, did you go through like an experience like that where you were defensive about animal rights at some point? I'm sure. Yeah, sure. I mean, most of us have. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I was raised vegetarian and my mum was um an activist um on and off as well so i had a pretty good start in life but mm -hmm. uh, for sure when when she went vegan um yo oh, yeah i was very defensive and i i didn't want to stop <laughs> eating cheese i didn't want to stop eating eggs we had some well they weren't particularly bad bust ups but i was i was i was a little shit i was not a nice person um with her about this <laughs> stuff um so i know i've been i've been there I, I wasn't trolling her obviously that would have been weird <laughs> just sure. sending her some cheese emojis like lol mum. <laughs> <laughs> that might not have been no it wasn't quite that far but it wasn't pleasant you know she she gave up on me and then um, i ended up finding my own way there but um yeah, no, I I see I see what you're saying. You know, I think I think a lot of vegans have been where this guy is. I actually interviewed um, somebody who was a a horrible troll. Um, he actually took chicken to like a, a chicken meat to a to a gym because he knew that a, a vegan that he trained with went to the same gym, like a friend, and he took chicken just to wind her up, put it in her face, um, and he did also to another vegan. He saw some ants and started killing ants and saying, "Does this bother mm. you?" He was a very nasty person and through trying to debunk veganism because he was such an anti-vegan, he ended up going vegan because wow. he couldn't debunk it. And then obviously he looks back yeah. on this now and, and, and he regrets it, obviously, but now he's an activist and, and actually goes out on the streets and can, encourages people. So it can, it can happen. Even people like this Madison, you know, saying horrible things like that. I mean, that's pretty horrible, but it's not as horrible as what this guy was doing like physically going yeah. out and being horrible to vegans. So there's hope for everybody for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, right. one of the kind of interesting theories behind direct action is direct action is sort of like this big blender, this mixing agent that's just mixing everything up. And the theory behind it is if you believe, and, and this is a big if, but I, I do believe it. And I think there's a lot of historical evidence for this that over the long term, the arc of history does bend towards justice, that hypocrisies, inconsistencies ultimately resolve themselves. And what you have to do is just kind of create energy, right? So okay. the, the problem isn't so much that people are discussing animal rights or women's rights or civil rights and deciding, yeah, yeah, I think it's a good thing for animals or human beings or women to be things. It's that there just isn't enough conversation at all. If we actually had a real conversation about it, we'd end up in the right place even if there are a lot of individuals who make mistakes systemically on a, as a whole, when you ask 8 billion people the question of whether a piglet is a dented can or a living being who deserves respect, the vast majority of those 8 billion people over time are just gonna conclude what every second grader concludes, which is, no, there is a difference and we shouldn't mistreat the pig. So the problem is we just have to create the energy. We have to create the potential energy, mix things up enough that that reaction can actually occur. And when you think about it that way, uh, e even people like Madison Cawthorn who are mocking us, even your, uh, is this guy someone who's a friend of yours now? The guy who's. Oh, he is now. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I interviewed him. That's just, awesome. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. He sounds like a great guy, you know, and yeah. 
But he, you know, his life journey is a demonstration of that, that there's something about just the provocation, the energy of even trying to push back against the animal rights that ultimately leads society. I'm not saying, and you and I both know people who have mocked vegans for years, yeah. who, are, who are probably not gonna change anytime soon. <laughs> but systemically, societally, the more we're having those sorts of debates, the more even trolls are coming after us, the more collectively, I think we will realize that animal rights is the future because it is. I, yeah, no, and I hope you're right. I think the only concern I have is that um, I think if you'd have said this to me, maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago or like seven years ago, I would have believed it more than today. And the reason I say that, mm. I'm curious to see what you think about this. We have a big issue now where the where animal rights has, has actually gained a lot of progress and especially the concept of veganism and the plant-based diet has gained no, there's no, no, a lot of um, notoriety, I suppose, a big reputation, a lot of money now involved in it. And this, unfortunately, has created a monstrous backlash. And the yeah. backlash used to just be like yeah, trolls and your odd influencer. But now we have leading, industry leading, extremely influential people like Joe Rogan, for example, continuously yeah. platforming m lies and manipulative um, manipulated data, people who don't know what they're talking about, speaking as if they're the number one authority on a, on animal rights and uh, the plant-based diet. And obviously he's sponsored by meat companies, which is why he does this. Mm -hmm. um, before that, I think what you said would have, would have, would have, I would have said you were hundred percent right. Now, after that, I'm thinking, you know, is, is, do you think this, this is going to be a big problem? This amount of, I don't want to use the words like misinformation, disinformation. I feel like they're overused and I feel like people have a pretty negative reaction to those words now, but it, it, what he's doing is absolutely putting out half baked ideas. Um, not always on other topics. So not on every topic, by the way, I'm not a Joe Rogan hater by any means, but on, on specifically yeah. on veganism and plant-based diets and animal rights, he puts out half baked ideas and inconsistent um and and bad data and bad opinions and they yeah. with, with no contest right do you think people like him are going to are going to be a really delay things yeah i mean it's a good question um so i think are you talking about this i, I know he's talked about veganism a lot because i've seen it on social media him mocking yeah. vegans yeah and i think he had like a carnivore doctor on recently is that right and they also had the game changers people on and basically had someone Debunking right. game changers without, I okay. think to his credit, he did ultimately have um, James. Uh, what's the guy's name? James Wilkes. Yeah. So, so James Wilkes. He had James Wilkes on eventually, but initially yeah. just had some dude bashing game changers, saying it's all bunk science. So, so let me explain. Um, like, so, so if anyone's listening yeah. to this and wants to see a Joe Rogan episode where Joe Rogan and the Carnival Doctor get absolutely just just stomped on by a vegan, go and just find Joe Rogan, James Wilkes, right? That's what we're referring yeah. to. That was brilliant. But it's been years since that. And since then, the only vegans that have yeah. gone on have not been equipped. Like Russell, Russell Brand went on. I don't know if you know mm. Russell Brand, but yeah, he wasn't but equipped you know to have it wasn't equipped to have this debate. He just kind of tapped yeah. out very early on and said, I don't want to talk about it. And, yeah. and this is he's only bringing on now weak source vegans who just aren't interested in discussing it properly. But he brings on carnivore doctors, like famous carnivore doctors, and they just yeah, go on there and just just rant and just give all this. And there's also what's a Ted Nugent, you know, there's an infamous mm -hmm. uh, clip of him saying about all these basically just focusing on um, plant agriculture and all the death that comes with plant agriculture as if it's all the fault of vegans without realizing yeah. that most plant agriculture is for animal feed and also most plant agriculture for humans is not for vegans, right? So for that clip, for example, there's done a lot of damage and a lot of trolls have kind of jumped on that and a lot of people have become anti-vegan because of that because they think vegans kill more animals. You know, and yeah. these, do you think these things, give, do you think they're denting our, the progress of these idea, ideas and, and progress of animal rights? I don't, honestly. And I'll, and I'll give you two reasons why. One is the same reason I'm not too concerned about Madison Cawthorn okay. mocking vegans, because I think it's just a demonstration that there's energy being created around the issue. And in the long term, if our biggest problem is just lack of attention and energy, even Joe Rogan trying to debunk veganism is a good thing relative to world where we're not talking about veganism at all. And, you know, I've been vegan for 20 plus years now. It's 24, 25 years. Damn. 
Wow. I'm aging myself now. I'm dating myself, <laughs> uh, which is really sad because I'm 42 years old. And I, there's don't a lot I haven't accomplished in life. <laughs> it's a little scary how little I've accomplished. I mean, I've done some good things for animals, I should say, like, but relative to what I wanted to achieve, which kind of tells you how ambitious I was 20 years ago and how stupid a lot of my dreams were. You don't uh, seem like you could have been ve around like vegan for 25 years and have left oh, over. Yeah. Like, yeah, you look really, you seem young, man. You seem very, you seem a lot younger. Well, thank than, you. Than, I appreciate yeah. that. Uh, yeah. If you got a little closer and saw how much gray hair I've had <laughs> growing into my head over the last two years, especially. No, um, but 25 years ago when I went vegan, I, like I didn't even know any vegans. I didn't, there, it just wasn't on the radar. There were no documentaries about veganism. There were no mainstream or, I mean, there was no alternative media at all, but if there had been alternative media, no one would have been talking about much less obsessing over veganism. And I haven't heard a huge amount of what Joe Rogan has said about veganism, but I did listen to one podcast um, with John Mackey. So John Mackey is the CEO of Whole Foods and the founder of Whole Foods. And I listened to that podcast because John Mackey is vegan, but he also was in charge of a company that was responsible for the slaughter and murder of tens of millions of animals and responsible for a huge amount of humane washing. So John Mackey and I have not been on good terms. He hates my guts. Okay. <laughs> He's written a lot of nasty emails to me over the years. And I just wanted right. to hear what he was saying to the public because it's a big platform. Um, and John Mackey, so two things I learned from that podcast. One is I learned that John Mackey, even John Mackey, who, you know, his company has sued me. They've tried to put me in prison. Uh, the company in Sonoma County that I rescued those chickens from, that's a Whole Food supplier. And so his oh, company yeah. indirectly is literally responsible for me spending time in jail. In, and I learned for the first time that John Mackey, even John Mackey, is an ethical vegan. Right. And that was pretty surprising to me. I saw it, okay, even this corporate CEO who's profited off of animal exploitation so much, mm -hmm. he has these deep moral concerns about animal agriculture. And the big problem he's facing isn't so much a lack of ethical understanding over the plight of animals. It's that he's not willing to dream big enough. He thinks the best we can do is bigger cages and better deaths, not a world where every animal is free. Mm. And and almost I don't blame him for that. I think that's a, a collective lack of vision, a lack of ambition that all of us have. But the second thing I learned from that podcast, and this goes to your point about Joe Rogan, is that Joe Rogan is really, really anti-vegan to the point that is irrational. Like yeah. from what I've heard about Joe Rogan, he's he prides himself on being a very calm person, you know, like he talks a lot about meditation and jujitsu and how I can handle myself in all situations. Everyone's overreacting. And I'm the sort of person who's really steady and calm. And, and John Mackey's not the best advocate for veganism. You and I can agree. There's a lot stronger spokespeople for the animal rights movement than John Mackey. I mean, for God's sake, the guy is a CEO who supports the slaughter and, and torture of millions of animals. Yeah. And yet even John Mackey just saying, you know what? I think a vegan diet is a healthy diet cause such a massive overreaction. You can watch the video. It's like it's like Joe Rogan is is jumping towards the microphone and like jumping towards right. his 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 interlocutor to try and stop him from talking. Like he can't bear to hear these things about veganism. Mm. And that again demonstrates just how desperate the response is. Mm -hmm. And so when I hear these people, the carnivore diet people, the hunting people lashing out about vegans using pseudoscience that is clearly falsifiable. I mean, the motion you're hurting more animals from eating plants and animals, that's one of the stupidest arguments in the world because, you know, 80% of the arable land to grow plants is being fed to animals. So if you really think that growing plants is killing animals, the best way to reduce the amount of number of animals being killed from growing plants is to eat plants, right? Because it's extremely bio inefficient to feed all these plants to animals as opposed to directly eating plants. So there's a lot of the stuff that they're saying that is just absolutely bunk science and e easily falsifiable. Mm -hmm. And the key thing is we need to create energy around the issue so they actually have to defend themselves. Yeah. And in 2024, the animal agriculture industry, the anti-vegans, the non-vegans actually have a debate. They have to defend themselves. And that's good, mm -hmm. a good sign of progress. But the other thing that I would know, uh, and again, I haven't heard all the conversations, but do you know who Lex Friedman is? Okay. So Lex Friedman's a huge podcaster and he's not known. I mean, he's a friend of Joe Rogan. He's a really good friend. And honestly, I think Lex Friedman might be the person from the podcast I've heard who Joe Rogan respects more than anybody in the world. Right. Um, and while Joe Rogan has a lot of podcasts that are very clickbaity, you know, just attacking vegans and laughing and mocking them for being stupid and weak. He's also had a couple deeper and more reflective conversations with people like Lex Friedman. And Lex Friedman is an artificial intelligence researcher. He doesn't 
he, he does do jujitsu. So he's involved in some of the things Joe Rogan's like, but he's very much an intellectual and he's a thoughtful, slower thinking, deeper thinking sort of guy. And I've heard deep conversations where Joe goes and Lex goes from saying all these dumb things about vegans to saying, you know what? But actually what's happening to animals is kind of awful and unbearable. And I remember, I don't remember if it was a clip or I listened to the entire podcast where Lex was just saying, you know, we joke about these things and I eat meat, but honestly, I've seen what happens to these animals and it is abominable. It's unacceptable. And it makes me think maybe I shouldn't be participating in this. Right. Yeah. And again, if the most anti-vegan person in the world is having a guest on his show, who's the person he may respect more than anyone else openly just saying, yeah, you know what? There does seem like there's something deeply wrong about this system. And, and you and I could find the clip. I should go find the clip myself. But I, I remember hearing it and thinking, damn, even like the most anti-vegan guy in the world has this deep, thoughtful reflection, at least when they slow down, when they get beyond the clickbait outside of Twitter, Instagram, threads, right. whatever it is, and slow down a little bit and ask themselves, what do I really believe? They believe in veganism. Mm -hmm. They believe in animal rights. They don't believe that piglets and dented can. Yeah. And, and that to me is a sign of progress, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And it, when you see these little glimmers, like glimmers of hope, aren't they? Glimmers of reason <laughs> occasionally. Yeah, I, I saw one recently. I was at a, a comedy show with a guy called Ryan Long. I went to watch Ryan Long. I don't mm -hmm. know if you know, he's a Canadian comedian, lives in New York. Um, very controversial. Not sure if you'd be into it. Uh, I don't know what you're into. Um, but um, if you like controversial stuff, then he's the guy. And um, he made a joke about vegans, which I was surprised mm. about, about vegan activists. And he, it was, first of all, it was a little quip and it was nothing major. It was just kind of like mocking us. But then he, he started to say, but you know, you know, I mean, they do have a point sometimes. I mean, I don't think we need to be boiling lobsters alive, right? And he started to make a joke about how people try to justify boiling lobsters alive. And they said, oh, they don't feel anything. He's like, I'm pretty sure they feel something. I'm pretty sure that lobster's trying to get out of that. And he made this whole joke about it. So. It's good, it's good that even though this guy's not a vegan, he's previously made jokes about vegans, but but there's a very big difference between being anti-vegan and being someone who's just not vegan and, you know, you kind of get it. And even in a mm -hmm. comedy bit, he could have gone in hard on vegans and just everyone would have loved it, but he didn't because he knows there's some element of truth to it. And like you said, it's a glimmer of hope. You're like, oh, okay. Even the comedian on the stage who makes jokes, roasting woke people, roasting all the different movements, even he has to acknowledge that, oh, okay, wait a minute. You know, they're not completely wrong here, right? Uh, and this is what happened with Joe Rogan is that he hates us, but you know, they're not completely wrong. That's a glimmer of hope, right? In an yeah. otherwise very dark <laughs> situation, yeah. Yeah, and I think, I mean, the, the key thing for us to take from this, it, if, if we recognize that all this trolling, all this backlash is, is a threat, but it's also an opportunity. You know, it's the old cliche. Uh, in Chinese, there's a term, weiji, which means crisis, but it also means opportunity, right? It's, it's, but it's true. Oh, okay. it's, it's totally true that every crisis is kind of an opportunity. <laughs> right. And the, the backlash against veganism is in many ways a threat, but it's also an opportunity. The key thing for us is we cannot react to the Madison Cawthorns, the Ryan Longs, or the Joe Rogans of the world with the same level of stupidity and immaturity. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not saying we shouldn't be strong in defense of our position. We should be, but there's a way to be strong and and and, and solid in defense of your position while also remaining calm and rational mm -hmm. and inviting people to the position instead of just lashing out and getting reactive because that's the problem they're facing. They're lashing mm -hmm. out and being reactive and and getting. You know, not that emotions are always bad, but emotions do sometimes distort your judgment. They make you say unreasonable things. And that's mm. kind of what the Madison Cawthorns and the Ryan Longs of the world are doing. And instead of getting defensive and getting upset about it, if we see these glimmers as an opportunity, recognizing that, yes, you know, the Madison Cawthorns of the world are mocking us, mm. but he's an idiot. <laughs> yeah. The Joe Rogans of the world are mocking us. But at the same time, they're having guests on the show when they have deeper reflections and say, yeah, maybe I should be vegan too. And I'm pretty sure I've heard even Joe Rogan say, making clips saying, yeah, you know, even factory farming, I have to say like, I'm very anti-vegan, but factory farming is awful. Mm -hmm. And I think I remember a clip of him saying, if I didn't hunt, I'd be vegan. <laughs> right. That's a pretty astonishing statement for the yeah. most anti-vegan person in the country to say, if I didn't hunt, I would be vegan because mm -hmm. how many people in America are hunting? Right. How many people are hunting on every one of their meals? Right. Mark Zuckerberg was doing that for a little while and he gave that up pretty quickly. And he's the richest, one of the richest men in America. If he can't do it, 
what's it likely that anyone else is going to be doing it? And if the yeah. best yeah. argument against vegan, the strong, uh, are the best argument against veganism, the strongest proponent against veganism is conceding, yeah, I probably should be vegan, except I hunt. Mm. That is a pretty strong place for veganism to be in my sure, view. Yeah. For sure. I want to just track back for one second and say uh, apologies to Ryan Long for getting thrown in there with the, with these horrible anti-vegans because he actually is not at all an anti-vegan. His girlfriend's vegan and I met him and he's actually a really nice guy and, and he said like, oh, my vegan jokes are pretty good, right? Pretty supportive. I was like, yeah, so apologies for getting dragged into this. It's nothing... You were one of the good ones. We're talking about Joe Rogan and uh, this Madison Cawthorn. I just feel bad with his name being in that same group because he didn't do anything that bad. <laughs> Apologies. That, that's um, my fault. I I, yeah. I owe him now for throwing him into that camp. I owe him to at least watch his bit about veganism. And yeah, I'm sure yeah. it's really funny. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we got to learn, we got to learn to laugh at ourselves too. Like yeah. if Because if, it's just like we've all met people who – overreact to even a little bit of light teasing, mm. don't be that person. Don't no, be that person. Yeah, you know, effective, persuasive people are able to laugh at themselves. And we as a movement have to be able to laugh at ourselves. So Absolutely. Ryan, I apologize for lumping you in that group. <laughs> I'm sure your vegan bit's really funny. I, I promise you I'm going to go watch it after this interview. I recommend you actually check out his, uh, he did a bit about Peter and um, where the concept is that um, Peter is now upset because they're no longer the most hated people in America and they're trying <laughs> to like get more hate. They're like, oh, how do we get more hate? Like, can you just tell me? It goes over to people in the street and he's like, tell me I'm a scumbag. And they're like, what? <laughs> it is, this is his whole, he's like, he does, he does combination of like comedy, real comedy bits like skits, yeah. but he also goes out and engages with the public and they're not in on it, you know? So he's doing yeah. a bit and they're like, wait what what's right is there something wrong with you you know so it's, it's a yeah. good combination you'll like it you'll like it i think i think any I'm vegan sure should it. like it yeah and i will say pete and ingrid nierkirk uh, have been marvelous role models for mm. using the mockery against us to our advantage because pete has always taken a joke when people insult and mock pita they just give it right back and and they don't take it too seriously and ingrid nierkirk more than anyone in the animal rights history Ingrid Newkirk, more than anyone in the animal rights movement's history, in my view, has realized the power of attention. You know, I feel like the attention economy that has erupted in 2024, everyone in the world understands. You look at the top 10 companies in the world, like Google, Facebook, all these companies realize the power of attention. And they're they're harvesting that attention for really negative purposes, just yep. you know, to get us addicted to stupid things, to buy dumb products. Ingrid Newkirk realized the power of attention. 40 years ago when she, she launched PETA. And a lot of what I've learned over the years is directly because of that. And again, we might not like some of the negative attention, just like a lot of people condemn PETA over the years for all the negative attention they've received. Mm. But Ingrid, one of her great geniuses is understanding, you no, know, even negative attention can be harnessed for good if we're strategic about it. And and they always have been. So, I mean, yeah. I know she's a, she's a, a contentious figure in some areas of the animal rights movement. To me, she's a genius and a hero. I mean, I think um, it's important that you that you mentioned that there about um, about Peter because I know a lot of you know vegans and non-vegans alike. A lot of people are against Peter, but especially non-vegans. Um, and the main thing that goes out there is that oh, Peter kills animals. Peter kills all these animals. I'm not going to get into that here, but but if you want to actually see a deep dive on that claim, uh, just Google. It's not Google, YouTube search uh, a video called um, Peter Kills Animals. And it's a uh, piece by Reese um, is a, who mm -hmm. made it. Um, so just go and find that. And maybe I'll put a link here to go watch it because it's it's like a it's like a 15 minute video. We're not going to do 15 minutes on this. Um, he's got all the evidence. He's got all the receipts to prove that it's wrong. And you can go and check that out. Um, but, um, you know, I was, I was arrested yeah. once protesting Ingrid Newkirk many years ago Say for exactly that reason. You did what, sorry? I was arrested for protesting Ingrid Newkirk in 2008 because oh. of exactly that issue. So I've turned around on that. So I, right. I more than anyone can say, yeah, do a deeper dive. Don't be stupid the way I was 15 <laughs> years ago when I got arrested protesting Ingrid Newkirk. I'm not saying there might not be differences. There are always going to be differences of opinion about things like euthanasia and about you know breed-specific legislation, all these mm. things. But there's a massive amount of disinformation out there. Mm. Um, there is enormous industry push to create this sort of infighting within the movement. Yeah. And whatever your views on on PETA and euthanasia, uh, these are allies within the animal rights movement. These are people like Ingrid. I mean, Ingrid 
I think she pays herself a salary of like $60,000 a year and lives in, you know, a Spartan apartment has done for like the last 40 years of her life. She spends every waking moment of her life fighting for animals. If you cannot respect that, then I don't know what you can respect. You know, I just, and I think that's one of the great lessons that, that I've learned over the years that, you know, don't let the narcissism of small differences. I, I just blogged about this um, on my Substack. There's this concept called the narcissism of small differences, where you hate your allies in some cases right. more than you hate your adversaries. And there's <laughs> there's a long psychological literature behind this. Um, I wrote a blog called "Why Do We Torture the Ones We Love the Most," and right. it's it's mostly about beagles and the torture of beagles, but it's also about the fights within the animal rights movement and how too often the people are closest to us are the ones we exploit the most and we can't do that. That's a really, I'm I'm, I'm glad you've mentioned that, um, the narcissism, narcissism of small differences, um, something I'd like to talk with you about, um, probably in another, in another chat, another call. Um, actually I'm very interested in that. Um, but it's, and it's a really good point as well, uh, that, you know, like, yeah, turning. So, so yeah, people turning the animal rights, people turning on Peter, as well as the public turning on Peter. I actually see a, a bit of a similarity between that with you guys as well. Um, especially mm-hmm. as well, not, not you guys, cause I'm, I'm thinking DXC, but, but you specifically Wayne, um, cause you've been, you've been very much a figurehead for all of this uh, that's been going on. I mean, obviously you've just been jailed, which was a huge, um, you know, a, a huge public, uh, event. And a lot of the public turns on you and calls you a criminal, calls you a terrorist. Mm -hmm. And that in turn makes a lot of vegans dislike you and what you do because they say you give vegans a bad image. You make vegans look like criminals. You make vegans look like extremists. And this is, I mean, you can say a lot of things, but when people say vegans are pushy, you can't say you're not pushy. You're going into the farms. Like you're the <laughs> definition of a forceful <laughs> vegan, right? And they say, that's what we're trying to, we're trying to show people we're not forceful. And you're going in and literally forcing your way into places to get animals and stuff. So, so, um, you know, I know you just spoken about Peter and defending Peter. Um, how do you, how do you defend yourself against that kind of uh, criticism? In the theory of nonviolence there, I mean, there's a lot of different components, but to me, Practically, there are two very important components that have led nonviolent campaigns to be extraordinarily successful. And there's a huge amount of research behind this. Erica Chenoweth at Harvard has done the best work on this, but nonviolent movements have been incredibly powerful. But when you look at the actual practitioners of nonviolence, you know, obviously Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi, Susan B. Anthony had a lot of elements of this work to her. The gay rights movement, ACT UP, was a nonviolent campaign in the 80s and 90s that push gay rights to public attention for the first time in American history. Mm-hmm. Part of it is being pushy. You know, <laughs> nonviolence is not for the weak, it's for the strong. Right. And nonviolence as King and Gandhi understood it was not just the absence of violence, it was active intervention to stop violence everywhere that you saw it. You know, Gandhi believed it was, it was better to be violent than to be a coward who runs away when you see violence. So he, the world's greatest proponent of nonviolence thought, let me just say that again, the world's greatest mm-hmm. proponent of violence thought it was better to be violent, to physically attack someone, to stop them from hurting someone else than to be a coward and run away. Right. But better than attacking someone and in the quintessence of effective social movements is to nonviolently intervene. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the other component of nonviolence, and, and this is something Gandhi and King both believed in, is as strong and pushy as you are, on the injustice you see in the world, you have to match that with kindness and respect outside of the issue you're fighting on, Mm -hmm. right? So if you are going to be a complete jerk and pushy vegan, then make sure you are a compassionate, reasonable, kind and respectful person in all the walks of your life. Don't be the sort of person who, you know, yells at someone when you're in a road rage incident. Don't be the sort of person who gets into fights on social media over dumb peripheral issues because The more pushy you are on the issue that matters most to you, the more respectful and accommodating and conscientious you have to be in other walks of your life. And there are even just kind of trivial examples of this, which might seem kind of stupid, but are really important. So, for example, in the civil rights movement, when they were doing these incredibly brave and risky actions, Hmm. nonviolent direct action, civil disobedience, where they knew they were going to face violence, they'd get dressed up in their Sunday best. And the reason was because, yes, I'm pushing really hard, but I also want to show that I'm a respectful person. I'm not someone who's just 
fucking things for the sake of fucking things, disrupting things for the sake of disrupting things. I'm disrupting things because there's an important purpose. Mm -hmm. And in all other walks of life, I want to be respectful to you. And one way they did that was just dressing up very nicely by showing respect to the people who were there. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a trivial example, but it's a demonstration of how nonviolence works. So what, what we've tried to do, what I try to do is, by all means, attack me for being a pushy vegan. I am a pushy vegan. <laughs> but when I'm in court arguing for the animals, when I'm interacting with people in my day-to-day -day life, I try to be as respectful and kind as possible. Mm -hmm. and, and the great thing about that is it makes clear that all the tumult and disruption and pushiness we're creating isn't really about us. It's not about who we are. It's about the injustice of the system. It's about the fact that we feel compelled to do these things because the system requires such a push because the system is so fundamentally broken and corrupt and abusive that we are forced, we are compelled to do these pushy things despite the fact that we are not otherwise pushy people. Mm -hmm. I thought for a long time, I need to blog about this, but um, I want to write a blog about judgmental, non-judgmental activists <laughs> because, right. and, and the reason that's important is it is extremely important to be judgmental on the issue we care about. Right. And it is just as important to be non-judgmental on almost everything else to yeah. show that we're yeah. not just judgmental people are going around calling people out for the dumbest reasons for right. X, Y, Z and, and W. We're judgmental on this issue because the issue is deserving of judgment. But in other walks of life, we're very open, curious, humble people who won't accept everybody. And, and I think that's something that movements need to learn to be effective. So basically, the, 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 um, I guess the TLDR, the summary of what you just said is, is those vegans who are complaining, you're, you're pushy, you're pushy, is, uh, listen, don't be a pussy, but also don't be an <laughs> asshole. <laughs> right? Don't that, be a pussy, that, that was a good TLDR. <laughs> don't, don't be a pussy, but don't be an asshole. <laughs> I think that's the perfect balance, you know, really. I mean, that, that was a much more Twitter friendly way of saying what I just spent 15 minutes saying. Well, I mean, you couldn't say that. You're the, you're the expert. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if I, I don't think I used that first word. I, I feel a little bad even saying that. Maybe I'm being too close to crap. But, well, look, um, I know, I, yeah, I, was, you know, some people get upset with it because they think it means yeah. something that it means. But just as an FYI for everybody, I've looked this up. The origins of that word have nothing to do with women whatsoever. It comes from an mm. old fashioned word called, um, oh no, what was it? You, go Google it. It doesn't come from where you think it comes from. So I assumed it came from cats and I was offended by the speciesism, not the sexism. No, it's not even that. It's, um, <laughs> it comes from a word. I thought you were saying cats are cowards and I know a lot of brave cats. There's it actually a brave cat in the office next to me. So it, it comes from a word that used to mean like huh. weak, weak willed or cowardly in old English but it had nothing to do with women or cats. And then for, I don't know how it changed. Um, but in my opinion, just a whole separate topic, in my opinion, the word currently, the way it's used, has nothing to do with women or cats when it's used negatively. It's just a word that we use to call someone weak or cowardly. So if it, I yeah, could have said, you know, don't be a coward, but don't be an asshole. It would have meant the same thing. So I don't know. Yeah, yeah, That's sure. the way I see the word, yeah. you know. And, and just to, because I, I like to provide some sort of kind of, evidence behind a proposition sure. um like for the vegans who say oh, oh my gosh you're creating so much backlash you're being a pushy vegan that's like an op-ed in the new york times we've also reached hundreds of millions of people you know even um you know glenn greenwald a pulitzer prize winning investigative journalist yep. who has exposed some of the biggest scandals in american history including like the edward snowden nsa you know, spy tapes that the US government was secretly surveilling American citizens without search warrants, which is totally unconstitutional. I mean, Glenn Greenwald has broken some of the most important stories in American history. Mm. Um, and he reported on our investigation of Smithfield, where we, we broke into the farm, we rescued some piglets, we went on trial, and we were acquitted. Mm -hmm. um, and Glenn told me when he wrote this article, despite the fact that he's literally written articles that have changed the world, you know, that have been on the headlines of every newspaper in the entire world, not just in the country. Mm. This story he wrote about the cover up of abusive pigs at factory farms, the fact that the government was going after the whistleblowers, the people who exposed the abuses, rather than the companies that were abusing the animals, uh, he said was the most read article in his history at The Intercept, like more mm. than any other article he had read. And it was I think it was shared 130,000 times on Facebook alone. And 
was I pushy in doing this? Absolutely. And because I was pushy, tens of millions of people, conservative estimate, tens of millions of people read about the abuses of factory farms in an incredibly positive way. Um, you can read this article if you just Google FBI cover up um, intercept or FBI cover up. Yeah, FBI cover up Smithfield intercept. You can read the article. It's like a 5,000 word piece mm -hmm. that only happened because I and, and a number of other activists were willing to be a little pushy yeah. and go to places where most people aren't willing to go. So again, but a huge part of it was Glenn wasn't vegan when he first reached out to me. And if I had talked to him and said like, you non-vegan scumbag, I can't believe you're not vegan. Why do you even care about reporting on this? Go vegan, idiot. You know, I mean, that wouldn't have worked. <laughs> Instead, I talked to him very rationally and explained to him why I did what I did, why I felt it was justified to quote unquote break the law because I didn't think it was breaking the law. Mm -hmm. And and again, the key thing is once we, we moved from the immediate gut reaction, like, oh my God, what are these weird vegans doing to actually sitting down and having long conversations. And I consider Glenn a friend now. And he actually went vegan as a direct result of this story. He's now a big proponent of veganism. That's um, but the key thing was I didn't react offensively to all the critical questions. As then a journalist, he's got to ask those tough questions. And he yeah. asked all those tough questions. And I responded in a very thoughtful, I tried my best to respond in a very thoughtful, open-minded way that just set out the facts for why we had to do what we had to do. And, and the reason we had to do what we did was Utah was passing an ag gag law. There was no one else going to these farms. These corporations have enormous political influence. They could break the law left and right and no one ever prosecuted them. And because we knew from evidence inside Smithfield that 15 to 20% of these piglets were starving to death every single year. Like that's not right. A little baby animal should not be collapsed on the ground, slowly starving to death over days and weeks. And, yeah. and so we felt that our pushiness was justified. And, and that's the key bit, you know, being pushy, but then also being willing to have those tough and thoughtful conversations that will actually right. create change. You've got to cut through the BS, right? You've got, you've got to do something that, that shakes everything up to be able to have these opportunities for the conversations that are meaningful. Another good example mm -hmm. of this would be uh, Tash Peterson. I don't know if you know of Tash. Um, she does a lot of uh, direct action and direct activism. And um, yeah, people criticize her all the time. But her activism, her really what people say, you know, extreme, it's not extreme, but her extreme stuff has opened her up. She's been on huge podcasts, huge anti-vegan mm -hmm. podcasts. She's been on the news multiple times, national radio. She's been invited on massive YouTube channels as um, they almost bring her on as like a gimmick, you know, like, oh, let's get this crazy Tash Peterson on. And she wouldn't have had even 1% of that opportunity if she had not done these dramatic, um, you know, actions that she was doing. Um, so it, it is just, uh, I mean, obviously in your case, it's way more meaningful um, because you're actually saving lives as well. But a, a big part of it is the spectacle, right? It is the look mm -hmm. what we've done. And now a lot of doors are going to open because people are like, that's crazy. You guys are crazy. They want to speak to you, find out what the hell is going on, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, I, so my background is, uh, before I was an activist, honestly, the fact that I'm an activist is a little bit of a surprise to me. Like 20 years ago, if you asked me, are you ever going to be an activist? I mean, I, when I started as a vegan, I was the sort of person who was like terrified to leaflet. I was terrified to go right. to protest. I literally, the first protest I went to, I was literally hiding behind my sign and the only reason I didn't flee was because I was too embarrassed to return the sign. I didn't want to go back to the organizer and say, like, I'm too scared to be here. That's how right. terrified I was yeah. 20 years ago when I started as a baby vegan. Um, so in my background is I was a social scientific researcher studying social change from like an evidence-based, a data-based perspective. And I still believe in data science enormously. Like one of the big things I'm trying to do is integrate artificial intelligence and deep learning into my activism. And that's a whole other subject. Yeah. But um, as a result, I talked to and know a lot of kind of the leading social scientists and political scientists of the last generation. And the one thing that you hear over and over again from almost every social scientist, well, two things. One is we don't know exactly how social change happens. It's extremely complicated. And none of us, even the world's leaders, leaning thinkers, know exactly how it works. Uh, but two, the one thing that we know movements have to do is be creative. They have to be open to many different approaches because social change is, is what social scientists call a dynamic system. A static system is one where the playing field is the same every single time, right? Yeah. And it's, you know, like, I don't know, you're, 
you're playing checkers. Checkers, the game is the same every single time. And maybe even you're playing checkers against the same person who's going to make exactly the same moves. So you really don't have to think. You know, every time you play checkers with the computer, the computer is a very simple program. It's going to do exactly the same things. And it's easy for you to optimize and create a, a strategy that will win. A dynamic system is one where the board changes. One day, you know, you're only allowed to move diagonally. And the next day, you can move, you know, vertically and horizontally. Right, right. One day, you know, the board changes. And instead of having 100 squares, there's 10,000 squares. One day, you're not even playing checkers. You're playing baseball, you know? And like, so the idea that you can take a checker strategy to playing baseball is never going to work. And the right. same thing is true of social change. Right. And, and one of the things I hate most about all the criticism is there's enormous amount of arrogance when you say to another activist who's trying to do good in the world, I know what the answer is, hmm. especially when you're in a dynamic system where the leading thinkers in the world have no idea what works. Right. Okay. So a huge part of what we need to do is just cultivate an openness to creativity an openness to diverse approaches. The only exception to that, and this is a little controversial, but maybe not too much. The only place where I think we should criticize other activists is violence. If right. anyone is engaged in violence, and that includes even verbal threats of violence, I think yes. all of us, I mean, we don't need to call them out. I'm not saying we should go and protest them or anything, but <laughs> that's a place where I think we should be calling our buddy up and saying, hey, you know that thing you said about um, punching a vivid sector? I, that's not what we're about. This is a movement sure. of compassion. We need to have compassion for everyone, even our adversaries. Sure. Yeah. I, that, that stuff tends to be kind of counterproductive most of the time. I agree. Um, I love hearing a bit about your story there, by the way. And, and I, I agree with what you said, by the way, completely. It was really, it's a really good way of putting it and a, very easy to understand. Um, and, uh, but I, what I was saying, I love about your story is that you said, you talked about how you were hiding behind the sign. I love that. Basically you're just a massive nerd who got so angry <laughs> that you just had to go out, get away from the book, get away from the computer and go out. But you didn't want to, I bet. You're just like, I have to. I'm so angry about this. I have to get out there. Kinda. And that, speak, yeah. that speaks to how big of an issue it is that it got you to go, you know, as basically get out of the books. And you sound like you, you know, you, you come across as the kind of person extremely well read, very, very, very into that side of things. But you got out there physically as well because it is that big of a problem that it, it got you out there, you know? And I think that speaks yeah. volumes. Um, as is someone like you, it didn't come naturally, right? Um, it to be definitely did not. a leader, to be vocal, to be putting your body on the line. Yeah, but it wasn't a choice. I mean, for me, I was thrust into it because I just, right. I mean, I had a catastrophic experience as a child, um, you know, seeing dogs being killed. And just, I, I still have nightmares. I mean, that happened, you know, over 30 years ago. Um, but, you know, we went back to China for the first time and in China, I mean, they don't hide this shit like the way we do in the United States. You see animals, including dogs, getting beaten to death on the street. And like my dog was my best friend, like a lot of kids growing up. And I saw a dog that looked just like my dog in a cage and I knew she was about to be beaten to death. And that it messed with me. I mean, it still messes with me. So, yeah. and, I, you know, I know a lot of people have gone through similar trauma have, having even just watched videos. And, and And the key thing that I've learned from that is just you can't just wallow in the misery I, it, it, for all the hardship and prosecution and like absurdity that's happened in my life from direct action and from rescuing animals. It's made my life so much better because all the trauma and guilt and shame and fear I felt from witnessing animals suffering and dying. I don't feel disempowered by it anymore. It's I feel empowered to actually try out go out there and make change. And even when I fail, I know I'm trying. Yeah. And, and that's a beautiful place to be in life, you know, to not just be sitting on my hands complaining about how awful the world is, to, <laughs> but to be trying and sometimes failing, you know, probably failing more often than I'm succeeding, but still succeeding often enough. Like every moment I was in jail and every day at trial, Jeremy can attest to this because, you know, he saw my screen and this is still um, my desktop background on my computer. I have a, a picture of a dog I rescued from the dog mate trade. And his name's Oliver. He's actually in the office right next door. Um, <laughs> and no matter what anyone says to me about my activism, about how stupid veganism is, about stupid, my particular approach to veganism and animal rights is, I can say every day when I wake up in the morning, when I go to bed at night, I save that dog from being beaten to death. And that is an incredibly powerful motivator um, for change, both on a personal level and on a political level. And it's one of the reasons I believe 
in open rescue because I think there's something about being the change we want to see in the world instead of just watching animals suffer or even arguing against the suffering of animals, just directly intervening and helping the animals. Mm. Um, there's something really, really powerful about that form of direct action. It's just about bringing the change you want to see in the world to life. Absolutely. And, and, um, that's a very touching, um, I didn't know this about you, by the way. I don't know how I missed that. Maybe, I, maybe I read it and forgot. I'm not sure, but but I won't forget it this time. It sounds like a a horrible experience you went through, and um, but what what an amazing person it created, you know, um, and and what a drive it created in you to to do what you do. Now I understand why you are so, you know, I understand why people are motivated, why vegans are motivated. I know why I'm motivated, but but I see in you like a, a different type of motivation. It seems like you physically cannot stop, and then I can understand why now with this, um, you know, with a bit more of your story and. An example of this, um, where you've you've actually um, again gone above and beyond what any vegan would ever <laughs> expect of anyone is is how you've uh, and your, you and your team rescued three dogs um, from this animal testing facility, um, which you're about to go on trial for. I don't mm-hmm. honestly, I don't know much about that. I only just learned about that when um, when I saw your post about it. I actually have I don't mm-hmm. have, how much are you, are you allowed to discuss um, with with the trial coming up. Well, uh, I've talked to my lawyer and he's very supportive of me saying whatever I want because okay. I'm the lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> so I get to give myself consent. Thank God. Because, I mean, it's it's often difficult, you know, and uh, understandably, yeah. a lot of lawyers tell you to not to say anything because everything yeah. you say can be used against you. So, yeah, I can talk about it pretty much openly. I mean, okay, I, so, and, so what that's one of the beauties of open rescue. Yeah. So um, back in 2016, a, a certain man became president of the United States that I think most of us recall. And um, his his entire family is involved in animal exploitation. Like, I mean, right. I will say there there are some members of the Trump family who are pro animal. I think I think it's the wife of Eric Trump is a big animal supporter. But for the most part, they're hunters, they're big meat eaters. Trump loves McDonald's. He is also very anti regulation. He's very kind of pro corporate in a lot of ways, right. um, which is ironic because. A lot of his supporters think of him as this, you know, champion yeah. of the every every man. When in fact, like he's supported by a huge number of billionaires, and he was in 2016 and 2020. Right. Um, but one of the the industries that he was hugely supportive of, unfortunately, is animal exploitation. Um, and and so there's a law in the books called the Animal Welfare Act, which is among the most important laws in the United States protecting animals um, from violence and suffering. And in 2016, and then beginning in 2017. Um, Trump did two things. One is he removed, he basically purged, his administration purged all the records of inspections that were supposedly happening under the Animal Welfare Act. And these are all public records. Up right. to this point, um, in, in fact, legally, they're required to be public records. You could just access the inspection records of facilities. And it was a huge engine of change because when an inspection happened, a journalist, an activist get get their hands on it. And quickly say like, hey, this company is torturing dogs or torturing bunnies, whatever it is. And this disappeared overnight. And there was a lot of coverage about this. I was like, what? Wait, what happened? You can't just you can't just disappear everything. And this is particularly disturbing in light of the fact that the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, which is responsible for enforcing the Animal Welfare Act, had gone through a series of internal investigations. Their own lawyers were investigating their own inspectors, concluding that their inspection protocols, and this is a quote, this is a direct quote from one of their reports, their accountability and fine system for fining animal abusers was quote, basically meaningless. That's their quote, not ours. They said, we're not actually enforcing the law. So the inspector general says enforcement is basically meaningless. We're not doing anything to protect these animals. And Trump's response and the US Department of Agriculture's response was, well, let's get rid of all the evidence then. <laughs> let's just disappear everything so no one can figure out anything's happening. So the other thing that happened beginning in 2017, and, and this is not surprising when you understand how these systems work, is there was a dramatic decrease in, in actual complaints filed. So the USDA, when they file animal cruelty, when they find animal cruelty, what they're supposed to do is bring a cruelty complaint and address it. And they can find, in some cases, even criminally prosecute some company for torturing animals. And... Um, in 2017 and 2018, uh, there was a report in the Washington Post that actually, I'm going to ask you, there are minimum tens of millions of animals covered under the Animal Welfare Act um, and hundreds of millions of animals if you include fish and mice. Um, 
But out of the tens of millions of animals, after Trump came into office in 2018, you want to guess how many animal cruelty complaints were filed in 2018? Filed as in, as in, as in what actually we've... formally brought within an administrative body oh. to move towards potential sanctions. Oh, I'm going to guess none. Oh, I guess big fat zero. Oh, one. one. Yeah. One. And that was, oh. so this, they went from basically meaningless enforcement yeah. to actually meaningless enforcement. Right. Okay. When you had tens of millions of animals subjected to all sorts of awful laboratory experiments and you filed one criminal complaint, that's like saying, oh, I think in the United States over the last year, there's been one crime committed. Right. That, that's absurd. It's statistically yeah. impossible, right? It's just statistically impossible that you could have tens of millions of animals and not a single one of them had a violation of the Animal Welfare Act. Mm -hmm. um, so with this backdrop, we decided, hey, like the government's clearly not doing its job. There are animals, including dogs, dogs being tortured as a result with no accountability, no transparency. I mean, literally the records are being purged and legally they're required to be publicly accessible and they're being removed. Yeah. This is the height of anti-transparency. So we decided, you know, we needed to show the public what was happening. And so we went into a place called Ridgeland Farms, which is one of the largest at this point, it's one of the two largest dog breeding and research facilities in the world. It's been described by many people as a factory farm for dogs, thousands of dogs raised in cages. They never step outside. And those dogs are sent to some of the most awful and just, it's almost legendary how evil some of these experiments are. You know, one of them is, one of them that was done on a Ridgeland dog was force feeding a dog laundry detergent, multiple dogs laundry detergent to the point they vomited blood for hours and collapsed on the ground in a pool of their own blood dead. Like that is the height of pain. If you've ever had digestive pain, like digestive pain is incredibly, extraordinarily painful. You can't get away from it. It hurts and you yeah. can't, there's nothing you do. You can't lay down. There's nothing you can do about it. Imagine digestive pain that's so bad that your internal organs are bursting open with internal bleeding and you're coughing up blood and vomiting, not just coughing in it, but vomiting blood. And this is not our description. This is, this is the vivisector's own description. So I'm taking their words, vomited blood for two to four hours and collapse and die in a pool of their own blood. So these sorts of things happening to dogs, not chickens, not pigs and cows, as awful as that is, most Americans love dogs. And um, we knew these things were happening and we knew the public was not allowed to see what was happening inside this facility. So we just walked inside ourselves um, and we brought in this, this wild, you know, $20,000, 360 degree VR camera. Right. So you could see kind of everything inside the facility. Every moment we were there, mm -hmm. we shot for a couple hours. And when we saw some dogs who were in distress, including a blind beagle puppy who had infected paws, was spinning uncontrollably, was going through psychological torment. Mm -hmm. um, all we did was what I do anytime I see a dog or any animals hurt, yeah. I took the dogs to the vet. Um, and now in a few weeks, in about a month, almost a month from today, I'm going to face very serious felony charges and potentially 16 years in prison for, for what we did. Uh, and the only reason they even know about what we did is because everything we did, we did completely openly. Right. You know, they found out about what we did because we published it openly to the world. We put it on YouTube. There was an investigative report in The Intercept. And because we believed, and I still believe, that... The ones committing crimes at Ridgeland Farms in April 2017, when we walked through uh, an adjacent door, I mean, it was an open door, right. um, were not the animal rights activists. It was the people torturing the puppies. And we will find out on March 18th if the jury agrees. It's a, it, it's incredible that it's, I, I don't see, surely the, the public should have some kind of say in how these things go. Um, it's it's a it's a strange system that we have where <clears throat> I mean most people should be out causing some kind of ruckus about you going potentially going to jail over this. I understand maybe less so with the other examples with the chicken farm because people obviously have their own motivations around chickens, but with dogs, they don't have their own motivations around dogs. Most people are actually completely on board when it comes to this. It just surprises me that there's even a the possibility of going to jail um, for that. But um, could I ask what happened to the dogs? Yeah, so one of them is, um, they all got adopted out to, to loving families after we you know, gave them care. And I was personally responsible for 
particularly one, the, the one who was in the worst shape was Julie and, and she was blind and spinning. We didn't even realize she was blind initially. And I think uh, after a couple of weeks, we realized she just kept spinning and spinning and spinning because she was scared and she was blind and she didn't know where to go. And when the world is dark and you're scared, one thing you can do is just move around in the same place. And it's become what's called a stereotypic behavior. It's so imprinted in her brain yeah. um, that even it's now seven years later, she still basically only turns right. She, she kind of doesn't know how to turn left because it became so imprinted in her brain that when I'm scared and anxious, I just turn right. That when she's trying to turn left, she does this weird like 270 degree turn. <laughs> yeah. um, oh. So she's with my good friend, Diana in, in Berkeley, who's just, you know, she's a loving mother to uh, a non-human child. And, and Julie's as much a part of her family as her own children. You know, she's got kids herself. But she loves this dog the way she loves her kids. And she should Amazing. because dogs are beautiful, gentle creatures who deserve our yeah. love. And they love us so much. They give us so much. Yeah, um, absolutely. And the other two dogs are in similar homes. You know, we're, we're, they, they've gotten to, to see and feel and, and love all those things that dogs desperately need in their lives. Um, yeah, so we're, we're very happy. We're, we're happy there in the place they deserve. And... Uh, no matter what happens in trial, I'll still be happy because Julie no longer lives in a cage. They're very lucky to have uh, that, that that they weren't um, taken and um, you know back to the back to the lab or taken and killed because that's mm -hmm. obviously something that sometimes um, they try and get done, isn't it? Um, the, the government, the police. The, the, did they actually try and come for the dogs, or was it? I don't know. How did that? How did that go at the time? They have not tried. It does not mean they will not. Right. But I would be shocked if they did, mostly because it is dogs. And um, and I'll I'll be honest with you, and I, I've said this before. When I found out felony charges had been brought in this case, I was happy about it. And I, I don't want this case to be dismissed. And right. I mean, the only reason <laughs> I hesitate to say that openly is because the industry and prosecution might actually wake up to the fact that these prosecutions are very different than the prosecutions that happened in the mid 2000s against the Shat kids. Right. And that we have a legal strategy and a movement strategy to harness them for change. I'm not saying every part of this trial is going to be pleasant. It's extraordinarily stressful. Yeah. Um, it's, it's extraordinarily unpleasant to go through a criminal trial. And obviously it's even more unpleasant to be in jail, but hard things can be beautiful things. Mm if they have meaning, right? So going through this trial and even potential incarceration, as long as the story of the beagles at Ridgeland and the animals suffering exploitation in cages around the world is being told, then being in jail is gonna feel good. And it, you know, and I, knock on wood, I was in jail for 38 days most recently and could be in jail for a lot longer mm. after this trial. I hope that continues to be the case, that I continue to feel good about even a hard thing. And it was hard. And I blogged a lot about this. Like um, my first week in jail, I was in solitary confinement and my only friends were fruit flies. And I blogged about how, <laughs> like I started talking to fruit flies and I'm sure the, the, the guards and the other inmates were hearing me like, they were like, this guy's gone insane. But it was actually really meaningful to me, partly because, and I could create those positive experiences because even though I was cut off from the outside world, like I was let out for 30 minutes a day and usually not even given an access to a phone for that 30 minutes. Right. Um, but I just knew because I, I had friends outside that I knew were going to continue to advocate for the animals. And so, you know, it's, it's definitely a stressful experience, but, um, partly because of people like you, you know, I, I know the story will continue to be told and I'm grateful for that. So, yeah, it's, it's, well, I'm, I'm glad to be a, you know, that I'm glad that if you do end up back in jail again, I'd be happy to be a part of the, you know, the group that keeps you going, you know, um, Thank you. because it's, uh, it's really important that, um, in jail, I can, I, I have never been in jail, but, but, you know, I, I, you know, I can imagine, um, how unpleasant that must've been solitary confinement like that. I, I mean, did you find yourself, um, like meditating things like that? Like how did you, I mean, how do the hours go? Cause I, I imagine some days they go very slowly and, um, you know, how, what were you doing to pass the time? I had all these, these dreams of making jail extremely productive, like finding time <laughs> to write and read and think about things. Yeah. And most of those went out the window very quickly because it's a very chaotic environment. And okay. 
I, I think the two things I'd say about my experience in jail is it's it's pretty astonishing how much the entire system seems to be devised to make people hate themselves. Just everywhere you go and every time people interact with you, they treat you like shit and just make you feel like a criminal. It's not just that they're punishing you like a criminal. They want you to really feel it. And there's not a lot of evidence that making people feel like shit actually makes them better people. Um, to the contrary, like in countries actually like Finland and Norway, where they have, you know, um, they have furlough periods. We can go visit your family. They try and keep you connected with the outside world in some way. Like I think the recidivism rate in Norway, I recently looked it up, is about 20%. So 20% of people go to jail, commit another crime. Um, right. You want to guess what it is in the United States where Con. we punish people and make people? Must be 60, 70. Yeah, exactly. Like 70%. Yeah. So you, you put people, yeah. So it's, it's a really weird system because in theory, it's about rehabilitating people and teaching them a lesson. It's like, this doesn't work. Right. Just, you know, putting people, I mean, and there's just so many awful things about it. Like as a Chinese guy, everything in jail is super segregated. It's, it's an incredibly racist place. The showers are segregated. The phones are segregated. The cells, you live with your own race. And as a Chinese guy, there weren't a lot of Chinese people in Sonoma County. So it's just like, you don't really have a place. You're just left out of everything. Wow. Um, so uh, I had all these dreams of making it a really positive experience. Um, most of those went out the window. But yes, I, the one thing I was able to do a lot of and challenge myself in doing was meditate. Because um, I had never, you know, like normally when you meditate, you try and find a quiet place. And there really are no quiet places in jail. Right. Prison's a little bit different um, for longer term stays. But in jail, there are always people banging on the cells. There are people who are mentally disturbed, screaming about things, uh, people getting in fights, people threatening each other. Right. Um, so I had to like really challenge myself to meditate in a chaotic place. And that was kind of interesting to try and meditate when everyone was screaming. Um, but the other thing that, uh, I did a lot of, even when I couldn't write cause I didn't have paper or read because I didn't have books was I did just get a lot of time to think mm -hmm. and challenging yourself to think when there are a lot of distractions is, is pretty important too. And I, I came up with an idea that I think I, this may be a low bar, but I think it's probably the most important idea I've ever had just from right. pacing back and forth in my jail cell every single day. And it's, I wrote about this. It's a blog that I call the law of social entropy. Okay. Um, and, and it's just, it's an argument for, for why societies inevitably move towards equality for all living beings. Right. And, um, and it's, it, it's a very optimistic argument of animal rights because the conclusion of the argument is that inevitably we will give animals equal rights as well. Um, but I, I mean, I would take forever for me to talk about it, but, but <laughs> it, it came as a result of just pacing back and forth in my jail cell for hours thinking about things. So that was interesting too. Yeah. I mean, if there's one thing you've got there, I suppose it's time to think, right? If nothing mm -hmm. else, <laughs> you know, um, no one's talked to or, or nothing to do that's all that's left, right? Just, just you, you yeah. and your thoughts, which can be, um, I've never been to prison or jail, but I have done, um, uh, 10 day Vipassana, uh, med mm. silent meditation, which is obviously I had the choice to leave, but sure. you know, when you're just sat and you have no choice, but to sit there and you have to close your eyes to, and you're not allowed to fall asleep. They wake you up if yep. they see you fall and it's like, all you're left wow. with is just everything here. And so I do understand what you say when you say, well, eventually I just had to, that's, I, I was exactly in that place too. And you, you come up with some pretty wow. wild stuff, right? Um, yeah. but, um, the problem I had was that when I came up with some of these amazing ideas, videos and stuff, and da, 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 can't write it down. So <laughs> I just, like, forgot everything. I left yeah. the place and I was like, is there anything I came up with that I can remember now? Yeah. Like, nope, no idea. <laughs> Damn. Oh, well, that was a waste. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, I, honestly, this is like one of the great lessons of my jail experience. Paper and pencils are really valuable because yeah. you just don't have, and I, I'm very lucky in that my. It, that first week I would not have had any paper or pencils to write on, except I'd been in jail before and I knew how important it was for me to try and get paper and a pencil. Mm. And so one of the first things I did just in the booking process was I basically begging every person I talked to, Hey, do you mind if I take a pencil and paper? Do you mind if I take a pencil and paper? Yeah. And one of the staff members did actually give me a couple of those like little crappy half pencils right. and just a couple sheets of paper that I could write on. And the only reason some of the blogs that I wrote right after I was incarcerated got out 
was because I had that pencil and paper. Otherwise, it would have been exactly like your silent retreat where I've just gone in my head and yeah. I've had all these like insights and then it disappeared and I would have forgotten them a week later. Yeah, but I had that pencil and paper so I could record those things. It's smart. But, it's so but, smart that you, you now you now you know that yeah you you know it now you you know what to do. You've got some experience with this so you you can yeah. be prepped for it, right? But it must have sucked the first so do you, time around. Do you do you think silent retreats? Cause I have never been on one, but I've wanted to go on one for a long time because I've yeah. heard I've heard they're kind of like psychedelic experiences almost. Uh, in terms be. of how they expand your creativity? I mean, to be honest but, with you, it's not going to compare to jail. I mean, I think you've probably yeah. had like the ultimate in silent retreats and doing solitary confinement for a week. But um, no, it's 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 for sure a strange experience. You have this, um, well, I, well, I don't really, you're not supposed to tell people what happens, right? There's kind of an unspoken hmm. rule. But basically, I'll just tell you that the first couple of days can for me were three of the hardest days of my entire life mentally wow. and um everybody agrees that on that and there is a reason why but if i tell you the reason why then it ruins it for you you have to figure this out yourself it's part yeah, of yeah. the experience um if somebody would have told me before i went there i would have prepared for it and i would not have had as much of an, a, an awakening experience right but yeah. but yeah the first the first three to four days of 10 days is, is by far just absolutely brutal, brutal. Um, wow. but I found myself, I'll tell you what I found myself doing though. I found myself, um, tapping my thumbs on nothing because I, a phone, mm. I found myself naturally falling into a mode where my imagination was that I have a phone in my hands and I'm scrolling yeah. and I'm typing. And that happened to me like all the time it, uh, during wow. the first three days. How messed up is that? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I've had experiences like this in jail. So like when I was in solitary, I started developing some weird repetitive behaviors oh. that are actually not dissimilar to what the animals go through. So like Julie constantly spinning to the right because of stress, it, it's a natural response of all sentient beings that we're sentient partly because when there are threats and stressors in our lives, yeah. we, we can respond. You know, that's the point of consciousness to figure out, okay, what can I do about this? And when you're trapped, whether it's a voluntary trap in a sense, like a silent retreat or an involuntary <laughs> trap, like a cage, when you cannot do anything to respond to the stressor, one of the things that happens to human beings and animals. So like, I think, um, with gestation crates and mother pigs, I think the percentage is like 90% of mother pigs show stereotypic behavior inside of gestation crates. Stereotypic behavior is just weird, repetitive behavior, like yeah. nodding their head over and over again. I think the most common stereotypic behavior in pig farms is, is sham chewing. They'll just like pretend to chew things. There's nothing yeah, in their cool. mouth and they're constantly going, mom, mom, mom. but I started doing this weird pacing behavior Whoa. and I had to like catch myself and realize, wait, what am I doing this? Like, this is really weird. And also I started like running to the window, the cell and like looking out every time there was a cell, almost just like impulsively, even when I knew it was nothing, I knew exactly what was happening. There was nothing to see. And, and that was just from a, a week, you know, you can imagine what it's like. And for you too, just a few days, just you start developing these like weird nervous ticks. Cause, mm. but it's, um, but I think the key thing is when you give back control and in, I don't know if this is your experience in a silent tree, but it might've been a positive thing for you because it was something you chose and mm. you, you knew you're going through this because I have chosen to do this. I can control this. And, and that makes such a huge difference when you endure stress by choice, as opposed to stress that's being forced upon you, there's just such a dramatic difference in how it affects your brain. And what's happened to animals across the entire planet is stress and agony and anguish that they have not chosen, um, which is one of the reasons it's so vile. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right about the choice element of it. I couldn't ever possibly compare what I was doing to what you were doing. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, the, the emotions that you must be going through. And you don't get any of these uh, ticks or anything like that when you do a silent retreat. And I think part of it is most likely because it's not forced on you. You've chosen to be there. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a huge, that is a big change uh, in the way you see it all. And, um, and you can leave at any moment. If it ever, if someone actually feels like they're going insane, they can tap out. Um, mm -hmm. and I think I got pretty close, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, yeah. you know, and I did eventually, I did, I did try to tap out, but the guy convinced me to stay and said, you know, I think you're mm. all right. You'll be fine. Um, wow. but yeah, you know, it's intense experience. Why, why did you feel like you needed to tap out? Was it just, was it the lack of social connection? Was it a lack of stimulation? You tell was yourself it, stories. You tell yourself stories about, you know, it, it, you try to convince yourself it's not right for you. Try to convince yourself that it you, you, this is not the place. You should do something else. And 
uh, because it's hard. It's horrible uh, sitting with your own thoughts. And I'm not going to tell you why, because people need yeah. to learn that themselves, right? And please, if you've done this, don't tell people in the comments. Don't ruin it for them. Uh, they need to see themselves why it's difficult. Um, and you try to tell yourself, yeah, you know, I don't need to be here. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I've done three days. I'm good. You, you do this to mm -hmm. yourself. And then you go and tell them I'm done. And, and you know, all credit to them, the guys running it, they're like, you're not done. Go sit down. Yeah. <laughs> Get back it's down awesome. there. You know, they, they don't take a BS from you. They're like, and you have to really yeah. have a real good reason for them to, I mean, you can walk out if you want, but you know, you want their approval, don't you? You know, they won't give it. Yeah. So I appreciate What was your relationship with social media and just kind of the digital world after you came out? Did it change? Because it's a good I, question. I, um, like I, as you might guess, um, based on some of the things I've already said, I have a very conflicted mm. relationship with social media. On the one hand, I just think it's absolutely crucial and we have to we have to use these tools because it's just where everyone's getting their information. Mm. On the other hand, I, I'm deeply concerned about how it's hacking our attention and our yeah. stimulation. And, and this is one of the reasons I'm, the idea of a 10 day silent retreat really calls to me because yeah. I'm massively overstimulated and I want to have that peace in my life. Yeah. So I'm wondering, d did that change your relationship with social media in any way after you came out? Temporarily, for sure. Uh, not mm -hmm. permanently, unfortunately. If temporarily, I didn't yeah. use social media for the first day. I decided not mm -hmm. to. And then the next day I did have a quick look and I was extremely disappointed because nothing mm. had happened. And this is the, this is the beauty. <laughs> <laughs> this is the beauty yeah. of being away that you realize that the world keeps on turning and no one really cares about you that much. You, you know, <laughs> you might have the odd message of, Hey, hope it's going well, but it's not like, Oh my God, I miss you so much. You're my favorite. Oh, yeah. I love you. So it's not like that. Or at least it wasn't for me. Maybe I'm just yeah. a loser, but the point being that, <laughs> you know, nothing really changed and no one really you, they just blinked and you were back. Oh, you're back already. That's how it was. Yeah. And so, oh. um, it was a bit of an anticlimax and I realized how just unimportant it is, um, socially yeah. speaking, but like, I agree with what you said. It's incredibly important for what we, what we want to do and how the change we want to create in the world. But as an individual, as, as like me and who I am, my friends and stuff, I realized how just meaningless it is. Um, I, yeah. I am not interested in showing people, Hey, you know, here's who I am and here's, I'm at the beach now. And I, I used to do that. And now I'm like, well, no, I'll, I'll just see those people when I see them. And if I don't see them, then clearly we're not really friends, are we? Like, I don't need mm -hmm. to show people this kind of stuff. They don't need to see it. I don't need to show yeah. it. It's work, it's animal rights and the social stuff can be real life. That's kind of the way I do yeah, it yeah. now. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so it sounds that, like that was a positive thing. Oh, for sure. Just for recognizing sure. your own insignificance. Yeah. 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 yeah I mean, that's kind of the, so I, I'm, that's I'm like kind a of bit a of a burn now, actually. <laughs> yeah. But, I, but I, I'm kind of a fake Buddhist and fake in the sense that not that I don't want to be a Buddhist just because I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm an amateur. I don't, I've never actually studied formally. I don't go to temple very often. And I'm also an atheist. So I'm like, it's more philosophical than a spiritual belief. For secular me. Buddhist. But one of the great principles, yeah, I'm a secular Buddhist. But one of the great precepts of Buddhism is embracing our own insignificance in the world. You know, that a lot of what we see in the world, a lot of what we feel in the world is, is an illusion. And, you know, there's this principle called anatta in Buddhism, that the self is a delusion, you know, everything we experience. And, and, but the inverse of that is that the world is reality, that part of what Buddhists aspire to is just recognizing, like, look, all these things that make me the center of the universe, mm. they're, they're delusion. The world's a lot bigger than this. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm a small part of it. But that can be a really inspiring and beautiful thing too. It's kind of like when people go up to space. I, I've read about this. Obviously, I've never been in space myself, but I've heard that when people go up to space and they see all the big things in human civilization, mm. like the Great Wall of China or you know whatever it is, and they see it as this little speck in this mm. massive universe and they look around mm. and even the planet Earth is just this little blue ball. Yeah. And they get this sense of awe and splendor because, well, on the one hand, you can look at it and say like, wow, I'm so insignificant. On the other hand, you can say, but the universe is so massive and beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and whatever my small part in this is, instead of arrogantly think that the universe centers around me and everything and everyone in the world is beholden to me, recognizing that I'm part of this amazing universe that is mm -hmm. so compassionate and gorgeous and splendid. That, that that really changes people and makes people more compassionate and more patient yeah, and just more peaceful. Because 
then all the little perturbations you feel in your life, like that person who was a little rude to you, or like the fact that you got a little stomach ache, all that stuff matters less because you realize, damn, the universe is so big and beautiful out there. And imagine if we all just work together, you know, instead of just yeah. focusing on my little problems in life, how beautiful yeah. the world would be. You know, so, we're going, we're I don't know. Going down. It sounds like you got some wisdom. Oh yeah, we're going down a road here. I'll tell you this, and then um, then we'll we'll move off the spiritual stuff because uh, <laughs> it's not what we're here for. But it is very interesting. But I had um, I woke up from a dream the other morning, and um, it, it's funny. It's kind of in line with what we're talking about here. And it was a completely random dream, and basically the concept I had, I come to a conclusion in this dream, and uh, and as I was waking up, I still had it in my head this conclusion, which was really interesting because it doesn't happen to me very often. And uh, the conclusion was that each individual human has their own planet, right? Which sounds weird, their own globe. Okay, and then in the dream, w w the, the logic behind it was um, their experience is an entirely different world. And I don't mean that as in just like, a, oh, look like out there. I mean, as in the way they perceive the earth that we live on is a different earth to the one I'm perceiving, what you're perceiving, mm. and what everyone, everybody perceives the, the actual planet they live on completely differently. So it's almost like we all have our own planets, we all have our own globes, oh, yeah. right? And the second you realize that, you realize that, like you, like you were saying, your your perception is insignificant because there's eight billion other perceptions. Mm. And you've got to realize that when you talk to somebody, you're not just talking to a different person, you're talking to an entirely different globe, a different oh, world, yeah. a different earth. And then this can help us, like you said, to see actually, okay, yeah. what do we agree on then? Because I know you're in a different world to me, right? Obviously, we are completely different, but maybe we share some values, maybe we share some stuff, and then we can try to connect. And um, and that's where, where change comes, you know, people um realize they're not living in alignment with the beliefs they have and then this is why they go vegan because they're against animal abuse yeah. but they're not living that way and then their world changes a little bit to be a bit more like your world and it was a weird realization to have from a dream but i really liked it do you think it's a bit, wow. bit woo woo or, or <laughs> what do you no, reckon? i think that's beautiful yeah i think that's beautiful yeah yeah were you on some sort of psychedelic or was that just a natural dream that was just <laughs> i mean i just feel like I had that's, not this, that's not the sort of thing that happens when you take right. lsd but I feel like I not that I've taken it. For the record, for all the prosecutors listening to this conversation, <laughs> I've literally never taken. I've never even smoked a cigarette. I've never even had a drink. Uh, but right. I am very curious about psychedelic substances because there's been so much research about how they they really do generate creative ideas. Yeah, and and you've not you've not done those things, and neither is your lawyer. To be clear, um, yeah, not yeah. neither I nor my lawyer are engaged <laughs> in any illegal drug activity. I promise you, absolutely. <laughs> No, but I hadn't. Um, no, it was nothing. It was a completely. I don't drink either. I don't smoke either. Um, I, I, what some people could describe as straight edge. I don't even drink coffee. I don't do caffeine. Wow. Um, for not for the political reasons, more just like personal reasons. I just don't like the idea of being addicted to anything, to be honest. Which is which. It pains me that I am addicted to social media. Is one thing I'm trying to work on. Um, yeah. But um, so yeah, it was completely just completely sober. Um, dream. Someone, someone somewhere did me a favor. I guess <laughs> if you wanted Amazing. to get get you know um spiritual about it some higher entity yeah. was like here you go sprinkle a bit of that on you there you go have a nice yeah. day <laughs> yeah um, so do you have do you have a spiritual background or do you have a spiritual belief system no um no i i, would, I recently did a video aimed at christians where i pretty much outed mm. myself by saying I, I think i would be called a secular christian um mm. but not to anything to do with the bible necessarily or christian teachings but specifically to do with jesus and and yeah. if I am led to believe if if I'm going to believe that what that he was real, then what he taught and what he did is absolutely everything that I want to be, including yeah. what he did for animals. Which Christ Spiracy, the new documentary, will be coming out soon. I don't know if you've seen it yet, um, like a preview of it yet. No. Oh, I, I mean because you're a in, very influential. I've seen the movie. You've seen the the movie. I mean, the whole thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. I I, I think. I had an opportunity to see it, but I was facing trial, so I never okay. sat down. But I've heard really good things about it from you people. You should totally asking. chase that up I'm and watch it. it. You should chase that up and watch it awesome. because it opened my eyes, and I thought, like, you know what? You know, I, I'm I, I secular. I don't believe in God. I don't believe that there's you know anything like that deity. But I mean, Jesus was like the, one of the OG animal activists, you know. And I'm like, wow, okay, I, yeah. I want to be like that for sure. And you know, whether you like it or not, the way you were raised, the, the, the society you grew, you grew up in, mine was influenced by Christian values. So I already mm. pretty much 
like all the values I hold are pretty much Christian values. And then I learned more about Jesus and I was like, do you know what? Fine. Damn. I'll take it. Secular Christian. Yeah. I'll, I'll take that label. That's awesome. <laughs> you know? yeah, that's awesome. Um, were yeah, you raised yeah. Seventh-day Adventist? Why were you vegetarian as a Christian? My mum saw uh, a, a um, slaughter truck full of sheep when she was 16 and realized, and saw them and realized where they were going. And then she was vegetarian from that day and um, an activist and, uh, you know, big into she didn't know about veganism at that point mm -hmm. and raised me with all of that you know i was raised um one of the first times i ever questioned why are we vegetarian she put on a vhs from peter and i watched this horrifying video showing the all the processing and the slaughter of animals at age 12 <laughs> so wow. i had a very awesome. very good start in life and it shocked me and it was horrible yeah. and i didn't understand it and i was upset i'm um, not like destroyed but you know upset like why would they do this this is horrific and yeah i never wanted to touch any meat you know never have your mom sounds time. badass oh yeah 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 your mom yeah, sounds totally badass it takes some good to do that question. to a kid huh <laughs> i get a um i i'm failing at this but i'd like to have kids someday and i uh, one of the reasons i like to have kids is because i'm pretty confident that if you raise kids well or even even not so well, just with like basic decent values, yeah. that they will be vegan. Do you right. think that's true based on your experience? Do you think if we actually raise kids in a decent way, they're inevitably going to be vegan? Because one of the complaints I hear from a lot of people is, how do you know your yeah. kids going to be vegan? You know, so many people rebel against their parents and they're going to start eating animals and they don't mm. give a damn about the things you care about. And I'm I'm just yeah. convinced that if you actually raise kids properly, they're they're actually going to be so compelled in the same way that you don't worry about your kids becoming cannibals, right? It's like, <laughs> no, human beings aren't food. Like, I don't have to work. I mean, like, no one says, like, how do you know your kids aren't going to start eating other people? It's right, like, well, right. because there's, I mean, th there's not a good argument for eating other humans, <laughs> and there's not a good argument for eating other animals. So I'm not that concerned my kids are going to become cannibals. Granted, I'm 42 years old, and I'm probably not going to have kids, but do you think it's a good argument against people having kids um, that so they might not be vegan? So, so it, it's, it's definitely a, a horrible, horrible risk that you, that you've got to take. But here's what I think. Basically, I think if a vegan's going to have kids and they're going to do it and they're convinced they're going to do it, I think any parent, no parents do this or like not many parents do this. And it frustrates the hell out of me that no parents do this or not many, they have kids and they're just like, well, you know, I've got my grandparents, they know what they're doing and I know what I'm doing. So let's have a kid. It is ridiculous. Creating another life is about one of the most, mm. it is the most important thing you could ever do, right? You go to a job interview. What do you do? You prep, you start and you go for an exam, you prep, you, you, tr you go to get a, I don't know, start a business, you prep, but you have a kid and you're just like, nah, it'll be fine. Yeah. No, you need just, to read yeah, up. True. You need to study. You need to treat this like it's a, you need to do a course. You need to do like a, you know, something more important. You need to spend years learning about how to actually raise a good kid. Now, if, if a vegan does that, and spends, you know, significant amount of time learning about how the best way to raise a child, um, to avoid rebelliousness, you know, ab avoid them hating you, avoid them just being horrible because you've told them what to do or whatever, whatever. then yeah, your chances of them being vegan are, are extremely high. If you just have a kid willy nilly and just, just mm -hmm. wing it, they might end up being the total opposite of you because you have got it wrong and you've pushed them and you've pressed yeah. them and they hate you for it. And the same way as kids, you know, some kids are raised being told they have to play piano. You have to play piano, piano, right? Mm -hmm. They get old enough and they never play piano ever again. They're amazing at piano. Mm -hmm. They could smash it because they know how to do it, but they're yeah. like, no, don't want to. Fuck that. Yeah, fuck, fuck you, parents, for making me do that. That you yeah. do not want that. Right? That so, so yeah, I think that's the message for every parent. They're not just vegan parents. It's like, yeah. Jesus, do some research on how to raise a kid before having one. Are you guys crazy? Like, what are yeah. you doing out there? <laughs> Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I know the antinatalists are going to be upset with this part of the conversation. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, you know. Well, I'm with you there. I mean, I, and I hadn't thought about that, but that makes a lot of sense that, yeah, I mean, literally creating another being, like a life that could go in a thousand different directions, yeah. is such a momentous decision to make in life, you know, because, I mean, most of the decisions we make that we spend a lot of time researching where to go to school, what job to have. I mean, it's still reversible. You could say like, Oh yeah, that didn't work out so well. I don't want to be an investment banker, but you know, I'm like, have you seen that South Park episode where they confuse abortion with in, like murder basically. And <laughs> so no. like Cartman, Cartman's mom is, 
is saying like, I don't know how I feel about abortion. And she's confused and she thinks you can basically take it back after the child's born. Oh, right. So she has like a seven year old child. She's like, I don't know how I feel about abortion because you know, I don't, you know, Cartman should have a choice as to whether he lives too. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike right. South Park, in reality, you cannot abort a child after, you know, when they're 17 years old. You can't say, like, let me let me take that one back. Um, <laughs> so it's it's a pretty important, irreversible decision. And yeah. 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 Honestly, it, that makes me think, why doesn't why doesn't society invest more in pre parenting skills? I mean, we, we have oh, like free yeah. education for the kids. Mm. We should have free education for the parents before they have a kid, too. You know what it could be, and this is me being conspiratorial, I suppose, is that they've got free education for the kids because it's teaching the kids how to be a good member of society, meaning join the workforce and do as you're yeah. told. Uh, but if they train, the, if they train the parents how to raise a good, you know, strong-minded individual, independent uh -huh. child, then they won't become a part of the workforce, will they? They won't become a yeah. drone. You know, they need parents just to pass on the lessons that they've learned from the system to keep everybody just working in the system and not questioning it too much. Um, yeah. I mean, that's my, that's me being conspiratory, but I mean, that, that would make sense in a, in a you know, wider system wide, um, kind of way, wouldn't it? Um, but yeah. the, the anti, I, the antinatalists would absolutely be angry because they, uh, you know, they, they believe that, uh, they, they, they're right in that you have a kid and that this kid could end up getting cancer and dying. And they most likely will statistically will get, they're most likely to get cancer or heart disease and die, um, in a horrible way. So they yeah. say, you know, bringing a life in shit. knowing that that's probably where they're going to go, um, is, um, uh, but they say it's morally, it's just wrong. They say you shouldn't do it. My argument back to that is, is that with everybody else doing it in the world and antinatalism only appeals to the more intellectual, uh, emotional and, uh, empathetic people. You're just going to end up with that idiocracy movie. Have you seen that? Mm -hmm. I mean, no, that's, I've heard it's really good though. A yeah, lot of well, people tell me I should watch that. Well, we're already there, to be honest with you. The the Apple Vision Pro Pro just came out, which is going to absolutely speed up the uh, progress to get to that idiocracy. But basically, they all sit mm -hmm. down. They all they're all sat on their asses, order and take out with VR glasses on, and they just don't move. And um, why would they? There's no need to, <laughs> right? So and, it's like Wally. I have seen Wally. Right. Yeah. Similar. Yeah. Yeah. Similar to that. Yeah. Um, so my kind of counter to the, this is just for the antinatalists watching, because I know you guys are going to be upset, but you can get in the comments and tell us what you think. But I just feel like empathetic, intelligent people, if they stop having kids <laughs> and then all we're left with is, I mean, there's still chances mm -hmm. that these other kids could become intellectual and empathetic and try and save the world and like do good things. But it's a lot less likely if their parents aren't, right? Let's be mm -hmm. honest. You're rolling the dice either way, but the, the dice are a bit more weighted in your favor if you're somebody like you, Wayne, right? Who's empathetic and intel intelligent and cares about others and animals and the planet. You're more likely to have a kid that also cares about that stuff. So I feel like we're missing a trick if we just stop having kids, right? Well, thank you for <laughs> rationalizing my irrational and unethical desire to have, have a family. I put a lot no, of but, thought um, into this. That's why. Uh, no, I, I feel you. And I'm, I'm glad you feel that way because it's just, it often feels very lonely being one of the few vegan activists I know at least to think it's actually a reasonable thing to have a biological child. Grin, not that I can even adopt at this point because I'm a convicted felon. So I think adoption is pretty difficult. <laughs> right. But just Man. briefly, this this idea that the next generation is is how change happens. I, I don't remember which scientist it is. I think it was like Schrodinger, maybe it was Feynman who said that, and he was talking about scientific change, not even ethical change. But there's like a famous quote by one of those prominent scientists saying that change happens one death at a time. <laughs> <laughs> but right. the only way we can guarantee that yeah. that that transition from one generation to the next is actually a positive change is for us to have some role in it. And so I, I do think one of the, the great failings of not just the vegan and animal rights movements, but all social movements um, is not including families and not thinking as hard. And I, I know there, there's a lot of people say like, oh, let's go give conversations and do education in schools and teach yeah. the younger generations. That's not actually how you shape the next generation. You know, kids, there, there are going to be occasionally some kid who's particularly sensitive who will hear one presentation and, and that changes their life. But if you look at the literature and evidence on how kids are actually, their identity is transformed, it's from their community and most importantly, their family. Yeah. Like their family, their very close friends are the people who really deeply affect them. And um, in the spirit of change happening one death at a time, one of the big dreams I've had is, and, and maybe this is kind of your experience to some degree, and I, I would guess this is one of the reasons you're the activist you are today.
But I've always thought that if I raised a child with very strong anti-species values, that their entire perspective on the world would just be so dramatically different from mine. And they would teach me so many things and be a powerful force in a way that I cannot be because I was not raised with those values. Right. You know, I like in everything I do, I've even like one of the things I've been was challenged on recently. Um, Thunvi, she's listening to this, is going to be super happy to hear her plug. But hmm. she called me out, not called me out. She called me in, privately criticized me for feeding my dog dog food. Right. And I was like, huh, it's interesting. Because if I had a human child, I wouldn't just like buy random ass canned food. Even I mean, like <laughs> yeah. there's good dog food out there. I mean, V-Dog's great stuff. Like right. shout out to the people at V-Dog because they make amazing vegan food. But if I had a human child, I wouldn't just buy this like kind of the same stuff and feed them. And I do try and change it up a little bit. I try to add a little peanut butter, <laughs> but I don't right. think, I mean, I say to people, my dog is like my child, uh -huh. but in many ways, the way I act is influenced by the values and norms I've been raised with from the day I came into this earth. And I've thought, if you actually raised a child to understand that like this dog in our family is not just a dog, not just a companion, but this is your sibling. Mm. This is a brother. You know, they're part of the family of life and the family, the literal family, domestic family of our family. Yeah. And and maybe just as importantly, this is your brother who is being targeted by the world. There are people out there who see them as lesser than. There are people out there who would treat him like a test tube and murder him just because of how he was born. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we saved him from people exactly like that. Oliver was a dog in a dog meat farm who was going to be beaten to death mm -hmm. because of who he is, just because of how he was born. Yeah. You know, to teach a child that from the day they were born, to help them understand the political and moral urgency of defending their own family member, I just think would make a powerful generation of activists in the way that we cannot even imagine. Mm -hmm. So that's my theory. It might be wrong. It might just be selfishness because I just want to have a family. But yeah. who knows? <laughs> I, I, I stand by that. I think there's some truth. That I've not seen the data you've seen, but but I feel intuitively it would be very hard to argue against the fact that somebody raised with values has got a far greater chance of, of ex accepting those values and doing something greater than you ever could than someone who's been raised with the opposite values who you now have to educate. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can't... I've never seen a, 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 I mean, obviously it's my word versus the opposite word, but I just can't really understand how somebody could believe the other way around in that, right? That mm -hmm. someone raised from the, from the age of zero, from one second up until the age of 17, you've been giving them the same values and you think you could create that same intensity in someone who's already 17 and you just meet them. Yeah. I don't buy that. I don't buy that you could do it. Yeah. I feel like I agree with that you in the sense that, the idea of like generational lessons. Um, I mean, it's just, it's just evident. I mean, just look like I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not, not racist because school told me to not be racist. I'm not racist because my mum told me don't be a little shit. <laughs> don't, don't treat people <laughs> bad. Right. Definitely, because yeah. of a different color to you. Right. It's horrible. Yeah. Don't do that. Right? I never, I never, mm -hmm. I don't think I, I think I might have made comments when I was very young. All oh, kids do, you know, why is that person that browner than me or whatever? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, that's because of this, 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 but you shouldn't treat them any different. They're just like you. Yeah. My mum told me that from a young age, not school, but if school had told, if, if I'd been raised being told like, yeah, they're all worse than you, they're all stupid. And then school told me, no, they're not. It would be a lot more difficult for school to convince me to not be a racist. Do you see what I mean? I think that's yeah. just evident. And that's why most in the Western society, most people are not racists because their parents yeah. have told them that's wrong, not because school told them. We need that same thing for animal rights. We need parents to be teaching kids anti-speciesism, that these animals are different, but you're not to hurt them. Not, not, not some education systems, education systems as well, but not as a replacement for a good upbringing and those lessons in an upbringing. So I think there's a lot of truth to what you're saying even though the antinatalists yeah. are going to be very upset, but it just, yeah. I don't know. It's a, uh, it's a rock and a hard place. Really. I understand antinatalism, but you know, yeah. we've also got these issues that need to be sorted out as well. And it's better that we're here to sort them, isn't it? Versus not. Yeah. Two things you said that, um, really resonated with me. One, one where one is just the, the fact that I almost think kind of having kids becomes more important when all the institutions outside of your family are teaching you the wrong things, like the yeah. schools, the colleges, the government, 
the, I mean, the government literally is persecuting people for giving aid to animals who are dying in factory farms instead of teaching people we should be helping animals who are dying in factory farms. Yeah. In many ways, it becomes even more important for on a grassroots level in a very kind of decentralized way for people to start building these institutions from the ground up. Um, again, I c- could just be rationalizing my own <laughs> desires. And the reality is, I mean, I'm 42 years old and I've got so many felony charges and, you know, I've been bankrupted by factory farms suing me. So I don't know if I'll ever have kids, but I do think it's important for us to defend people who want to have kids. Um, but the second thing uh, that that what you were talking about um, brought to my mind is um, something that, again, this Erica Chenoweth scholar, pretty sure she was the one who told me this. She's a professor of political science at Harvard who studied social movements. And one of the things uh, she said is that effective movements have grandmothers and families hmm. and you cannot build a future when there's, when the future is not represented by your movement and the past, like good movements are situated in history. We can link our work and our values and, and even our, our people hmm. to the past and we can link them to the future. Yeah. Otherwise that's the definition of change. Change is there's a past, there's a present, and there's a future. And if all we are are like 25-year-old Gen Z folks on Instagram, and that's the entire movement, it's, well, those 25-year-old Gen Z kids on Instagram are going to be 35-year-old professional millennials someday. Mm-hmm. And eventually, they're going to be 50-year-old people with busy lives and probably children themselves, even if at 25 they didn't want to have kids. Mm-hmm. And eventually, they're going to be grandparents. Yeah. And for you to model the future of the world that supports veganism and animal rights, you have to start creating that today show right. that there's this intergenerational representation in your movement. Yeah. And so like the anti-family stuff and the anti-natalism stuff, I've talked to a lot of vegans who have kids who don't feel welcome in the vegan yeah. community. And that's bad. That. That's really bad for the future of veganism in Definitely. my view. But again, I don't want to engage in needless infighting either. So all the <laughs> anti-natalism, all, I love you all. I think you're awesome. And I, I think it's great that you're vegan. Uh, I think all of us should have thoughtful conversations about this and hopefully fight a little less about who has kids and who does not. Totally. And I think this is an interesting, uh, this is an interesting rare crossover between the conservatives and the vegans have kids, have Mm. families. It's a, it's a, you know what I mean? Because they, it's one of those, um, it's usually associated with more progressive people to not, you know, don't have Mm -hmm. kids. Right. That's kind of like a more progressive idea. So it's, like I said, there's, um, we've got to take those where you can get them. Those, um, because we have to reach over the aisle on some points, don't we? We, we need to get everybody Agreed. on board with what we're doing. And this is probably one of them, right? So yeah. I'm sure I'm sure some right-wing vegans um, who are like currently applauding this conversation, <laughs> those guys never yeah. get, they very rarely see anything in a vegan conversation that they that they are happy with, I suppose, because, um, you know, most vegans hate them, which is an interest, another interesting point. Most progressive vegans hate right-wing vegans, I mean, which is um, yeah. a whole other topic, but yeah, another time maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm with you 100% there, and I'll just say it is a left-wing progressive prosecutor in Wisconsin who's trying to put me in prison. Oh, really? And it was a bunch of right-wing – yeah, his name's Ismail Ozan. He likes to talk about how he defends the vulnerable, and he's really concerned about victims of abuse while he's defending one of the biggest abusers in the entire county, Ridgeland wow. Farms. And it was a very conservative set of jurors in an agricultural county in southern Utah who sided with us against a big factory farm. So the notion that just because someone's right wing, they don't understand how power can be abused. In many ways, I think there are a lot of really disturbing trends on the right, but one of the most inspiring trends on the right is populism. I think populism is good for the future of the world. And obviously the populism of someone like Trump is in my view, not genuine populism. I think he's harnessing that movement and in many ways using deception and manipulation to take the energy of populism in a very bad direction. Mm Because for example, he is supported by a lot of billionaires Right. despite the fact that he claims to be on behalf of the working class. But even the idea that the right wing of the United States and probably around the world is a movement that represents everyday people and, and hopefully maybe eventually everyday animals, that's a good trend. I'd much rather that than a movement that's representing only big corporations that are destroying the planet. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. For so. sure. I agree. I think that's that's the whole that, that's a whole literal podcast in itself, that topic, because it's just such a, I've had people come on here and debate that. And, um, you know, I've had some pretty crazy takes that I've had some people claim it's uh, impossible to be vegan and right wing. It's just, it's just, there are odds and it's, it's phenomenal to me how you'd yeah. want to exclude an entire, you know, so many people, so many people to exclude them from being a part of 
um, something positive for animals over political differences on other topics. It's um, yeah, yeah, mind boggling to me. Um, but it, you know, again, it, it's too much to get into today. But I've got other videos, uh, guys. If you're going to go on the channel and, and look for stuff like that, and there's also other channels like um, I recommend Carnism Debunked. Don't know if you know of of George. Um, he makes very good content on this topic, actually, quite a lot. Um, gets in a lot of trouble for it as well. He's very. He's is this very, George Martin? George Martin. Yeah. Yeah, I know George Martin. I didn't realize he had a new channel. No, he's cool. always been the same. Carnism debunked. It's always been. Uh, but oh, he's on um, really? Instagram okay. as George Martin now, I think. But anyway, yeah, he's okay. a good guy. Very controversial, but he's he's made some pretty good videos on this topic as well. Um, so um, I want to ask you now, just to get back to the trial, upcoming trial. I said earlier that I feel like the majority of people should. Um, be very outraged by this trial even being a question <laughs> like just the idea that you could go to jail for that long or even at all should just outrage most people so if they are outraged then what what options do they have um either to help you or or to help animals um, in these testing labs yeah so the kind of immediate thing that we're trying to mobilize people behind which i'm really glad you know we reached out to you and you're kindly willing to do this interview partly for this purpose is that there's going to be a big day of action just on social media on March 18th, the first day of the trial, uh, just pointing out that these are the most gentle uh, beagles were literally selected as the dog of choice in animal experimentation because they're trusting and loving because they love us so much. You can punch them in the face. You can force feed them. You can vivisect them and they will never fight back. And that is such a deep and profound betrayal. Of, of not just the dog, but everything good in ourselves, the betrayal of ourselves, you know? Yeah. So on March 18th, we, we're going to ask everyone to use the hashtag people betrayal, right to rescue, um, to just elevate the case in some way. And there's, you, you'll see materials on both the direct action ever and simple heart, social media and websites. Literally all you have to do is copy and paste and, yeah. and tweet it out, put it on Instagram, put it on Facebook, whatever, on every platform you can. Uh, but beyond that, you know, our, our big campaign is is to really push for the prosecution to prosecute animal abuse and not animal rescue. Mm -hmm. and, and this is not just important for this particular facility, which is really important because if they do start prosecuting animal abuse and not animal rescue, that probably will just end experiments on dogs because there's only two large beagle breeding and research facilities in the nation left, Marshall and Ridgeland. Right. If Ridgeland is, is, is gone, that's the end of dog experiments because there's only one facility left and that facility is not going to be able to withstand the amount of pressure and attention of the other two big facilities. Because in, in Vigo went down last year. Mm -hmm. If Widgeon goes down this year, dogs and experiments are gone. Okay. But the other really important principle that we haven't talked about much in this case is if, if the prosecution recognizes that they should be prosecuting the animal abuse and not the so-called animal theft, that is implicitly, and maybe even explicitly in court, a recognition of probably the most important legal principle in animal rights, in my view, which is legal personhood, whether animals are persons or property. Mm -hmm. And if animals are persons in a common law system, I'm not gonna get into too much of the jargon and the philosophy because it's boring and only lawyers <laughs> like talking about it. Okay. But the basic idea is when someone has been established as a legal person, that creates an entire set of rights far beyond the specific case. The US Constitution, for example, gives all persons, it's literally in the Bill of Rights, that all persons have a right not to be deprived of their life and liberty without due process of law. And there was a time when people of color, black people, immigrants, when women were denied personhood. But once courts started acknowledging that there are persons, then every decision made by anyone in the country that deprived someone of their life and liberty was subject to constitutional scrutiny, right? Which is what's allowed a hundred years of incredible activism since the emancipation of chattel slaves in the United States in the 1860s. And if we can win some of these cases politically, and, and that might even mean sending someone to jail for a little while, but just elevating the legal principle, because one of the ways we can win is by me sitting in jail and everyone saying, this is ridiculous. There's a right. difference between a dog and a dented can. Like our legal system needs to evolve. Like the key thing is to develop a political momentum behind personhood. And everyone who's participating on March 18th it's not just about my freedom. It's not just about the freedom of these beagles. It's about the right of every sentient being on this planet to be given their life and liberty, right? And, and we can push that principle in court and the court of public opinion on March 18th. But beyond that, 
if anyone wants to share any of the stuff we're doing on Instagram, on Wayne H. Young, um, I don't even know what my handle is on Twitter and all the other platforms, but you can find me very easily. And, um, and people should also sign up to my Substack, which is called The Simple Heart. Just go to Simple Heart Substack because we have a newsletter where I'll be publishing accounts of what's happened in this trial because I'll be blogging every week through the trial and you'll get updates. And that's a great way for you to find out beyond the day of action on March 18th what you can do to support. That's great. I'll put the links to all of that uh, down below so people can get to it nice and easily. Um, awesome. Yeah, and it, I think uh, well, I'll be on March eighteenth. I'll do some. I'll do something for it. I'll get something prepared for it. Hopefully, we can rile up some people Thank on you. Um, Instagram. Um, we'll sort something out. Yeah, we'll talk later about that. Um, cool. Listen, it's been awesome to have you here. Um, thank you again so much for coming here and doing this and 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 obviously thank you for not just the work you're doing currently but the what you have done for such a long time uh i, I don't i mean i don't think we really got into just quite how much you've been doing over the years and um obviously it's i know you i know what you'll say it's not about you which i understand it's not about you it's about what you stand for and it's about who you're trying to help and, I, and obviously i acknowledge that and we all acknowledge that but i'm sure i speak for many, when I say that your your work for helping animals is very much appreciated and has inspired many activists, including myself, to take more quote unquote extreme measures. Uh, I suppose that's what they call us, right? Um, to help animals, and um, you know that's that's no small thing. So you know, again, um, thank you for coming on, and thank you for for being that person, Wayne, and, and um, continuing to inspire um, so many of us to keep on pushing. We appreciate it. Yeah, I'm right back at you. It's always a team effort and you're doing incredible work. And, you know, I wouldn't be able to do anything that I've done without our team. You know, Jeremy, who's in this call listening in, uh, Dean and Prayer, the co-founders of The Simple Heart, Almira Tanner took over DXE after I stepped down because I was burned out. You know, we got other team members like my buddy Joe, who's making all our videos, Maurice helping us close the building. We have a team member, Shalau, who does all our social media. So every, I mean, I'm sure you got people are supporting you too, but yeah, yeah. there's the public faces and then there's the actual face. And the actual face of this movement is is all the people, including just the people on social media who are following all these channels and doing things in their lives to push for animal rights. You're all part of the team and we're all grateful for you. So Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. Yeah, it goes up. Yeah. So please, people, keep doing that. Keep on supporting, keep liking, keep, um, if you're donating, keep donating, keep sharing um, everything you can. And remember that the next big thing is um, March 18th is to to um, get on that hashtag. And, and as I said, I'll put all the links down below so you can get all the information on that as well. Um, is there anything you wanted to say that we that I missed out that you'd like to, to close us off with? Good gosh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, Open mic. Yeah, just just a lot of gratitude to everybody. You know, this the last few years have been really hard in my life. Um, yeah, it's, it's weird because when I'm doing interviews, I'm on. But and so everyone thinks that, you know, I'm, I'm a really happy person. And I I am happy when I'm thinking about animals and thinking about animal rights and thinking about all the good things we can do. But you know, I've had a lot of loss in my life in the last couple of years and a lot of really terrible infighting is is hurt a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'm just reminded even from this conversation about just how grateful I am for for the people who are kind in a very cruel world. So thank you all for being kind. Great. Well, thank you all for watching and for being kind, as Wayne said. And goodbye for now. I'll see you in the next one. And if you want to help me with my vegan and animal rights work, check out the David Rams Patreon and YouTube teams in the description.